let's call this meeting to order. Uh, it is July 28th at 5 p.m. Uh, welcome everybody um, that's listening in and introduce all our directors that are out there. Uh, Director Clausen, Eastham, uh, Godwin, Malone, Ressler, and Williams, and Superintendent Matt Digner and Recording Secretary, Secretary Kim Colvin is here. Um, uh, we are going to move into our community comment. And if anybody uh, that is listening in would like to make a comment, uh, you can use the raise hand feature and we'll call on you and uh, Kim will give you authorization to speak. And we'll do our community comment here at the beginning of the meeting and you'll be limited to four minutes. Um, so I, we will move right into it. We have one hand raised right now. Um, it looks like it's uh, Mary Kate. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Is this um, Paul's last meeting? No, August uh, 25th. Then I don't have anything to say, so I take my hand back down. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> all right. Sounds like we will all be prepared for a roasting of Paul in a few weeks. I could just keep pushing it back if you guys don't want to hear from Mary Kate. <laughs> we'll okay. keep that in mind. Uh, is there anybody else uh, wish to make some community comment before we move on? I'll give everybody a second to think about it. Don't see any more hands raised, so we will move on to our first agenda item, which is uh, approval of the agenda. I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve tonight's agenda. Second. Second. Well, I think that was a tie, but I think we are ready to vote. Who was the tie between before second? I thought I heard uh, maybe Charlie and JP, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> you can pick your favorite. But don't tell anybody um, it was your I favorite. I picked the first one. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right. And so we have our consent agenda. Um, I know that uh, Director Clausen had a couple questions on some of the expenses for uh, special ed going to other districts and we kind of had them answered by email. I don't know if Anybody wants to speak to them in this forum? All right. Uh, any other questions from directors as they looked through the bills? Everything looked fine to me when I looked through them. All right. Any items needing to be pulled from consent? You guys are making this way too easy. Um, all right. Then I would entertain a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve consent. Second. All right, Kim, I think we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, this meeting shouldn't take more than 10 minutes then the way things are going. Oh wait, we're moving on to return to learn update. That might take a little bit longer. Um, I'm just going to turn it right over to you, Matt, to kind of kick us off. I know that uh, there's quite a bit of update and probably have more folks from the team speak. So I'll just let you have at it. All right. Thanks, Sean. Good evening, uh, board members and uh, to the community also listening in. Um, I have a couple updates here for you and a, a couple attachments to draw your attention um, to as well. And then, yeah, we'll have um, Chase and Amy uh, take some some portions of this conversation tonight. But one to let you know, we met with the Department of Ed last week on Thursday and talked to them about our um, recommendation and decision to start the year offsite and asked about um, permission to begin the year uh, in that model. Um, they weren't willing to give us any uh, kind of indication around if that would be granted or not at this point and, and stated that the uh, criteria for those temporary moves um, to remote continuous learning uh, would be uh, published around August 1st. Um, they've stated August 1st a couple times to us. Obviously, that's Saturday. 
Um, so we don't know if we'll receive something on Friday or Monday. Um, they also talked to us about the turnaround in that decision uh, being fairly quick. And so uh, we want to have our uh, ducks in a row uh, to be able to make that request and, and have them uh, turn that answer around to us uh, as we uh, continue to kind of navigate in this uh, uncertain uh, territory here after uh, we made that decision, the governor issued her proclamation. And so we had a good conversation with them. Uh, they just weren't able or willing to share uh, much additional detail in that regard about um, if we would be uh, granted that temporary, um, I know, I'm trying to hesitate calling it a waiver because they're getting away from calling it a waiver and want to uh, say that it's permission or you know the request to do so. Um, I think another key part of that will be what those criteria are. And um, I think probably just locally for us to, to know um, that you know, the state's threshold on that might be different than uh, what we think about that locally. And so we're eager to, to see what, what those criteria look like and what that process is and are anticipating we get that. Um, but well, I shouldn't say we're anticipating we'll get the, the, the request to do that. We're anticipating that we'll get that guidance uh, here hopefully towards the end of the week or the beginning of next week. Uh, to that end, what you, the first attachment I'd just like to draw your attention to is our letter um, of support uh, from the Johnson County Department of Public Health uh, that they provided that we'll obviously uh, have submitted to the State Department of Ed, but we'll again submit once we have those criteria that talks about and further uh, states their reasoning uh, for supporting our uh, request to start in that uh, environment in an offsite environment. But, um, Mainly in there, you see the detail about the large influx of uh, students in the uh, to the university campus in the age range from 18 to 24, and how that will affect the community spread uh, in that regard, uh, potentially throughout our, our local area. And so that would that'll be a key piece for us to to submit in that request. Um, another thing we're bringing for your consideration tonight that we'll follow up again with next week, uh, but would be open to any questions around would be the calendar. Uh, one of our uh, early decisions was not to uh, do anything different with the school calendar, uh, but as we've uh, kind of been uh, had a step back here uh, based on that uh, late guidance we got from the State Department of Ed and the governor, uh, that's changed some some things in uh, our ability to move some things forward. Um, we, we also uh, believe that with this calendar that has a post Labor Day start um, that It'll help support our claim to the uh, Department of Ed because we're really moving from a, a five-week ask to a three-and-a-half-week uh, ask, and they've uh, been pretty clear that with the way they're considering uh, this conversation is for short periods of time, and so we think that would allow us to uh, obviously uh, see the, the university population come into the community, give us a period of time to start an off-site model, um, and then if conditions warrant it, be able to transition to that on-site uh, environment at the appropriate time. Um, so the calendars you have attached uh, to the board docs there show uh, that post Labor Day start with those uh, front end August days moved to June. And so really the the big thing that we're uh, would probably want to draw your attention to the reason we're bringing that is because of the change in the state guidance and the uncertainty about the start. Uh, we know that's a that's a shift for our community as we've traditionally started in August and not waited till that after Labor Day start. Uh, we believe the association is supportive of, of that change, uh, but wanted to show you, you that this evening as well. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, it'll allow us to help put the staffing picture together after registration. Um, we anticipate, uh, since we are in um, kind of a limbo uh, period here, that we'll have an additional amount of students sign up for the K-12 online learning program. And so that staffing uh, puzzle will be a little bit uh, more challenging to put together and make sure we have staff aligned to the students. Um, I already mentioned the days being added into the end of the year. Another question my, people may ask is about snow days. Uh, snow days are not um, the same concern that they would be in a typical year as the state has told us that unless we have uh, more than five consecutive uh, snow days, we would not need to make those up as long as we're offering remote continuous learning, uh, similar to how we're suggesting we'd start the year in that offsite learning environment. Um, so we wanted to show those to you tonight and then um, schedule um, a hearing and a potential vote on that proposed change uh, for the following week, if that was uh, something the board would be willing to entertain uh, looking at in this time period. So a um, couple big things there on the outset would be just kind of progress on where we're at with the state and then why we're uh, 
attaching that calendar for your review and, and comments on. So I could kind of take questions on those couple items maybe before we dig into some other details this evening. So Matt, if this comes to a vote next week on the calendar, are you also saying that because of the way the calendar is written, then it's a, we're going to have the hybrid model or that's just in case we don't start online? Um, I'm trying to understand the back end of your, the second half of your question there, Paul. So I think it's not necessarily because or, or not because of that. I think there's reasons to support delaying the start no matter what, whether we need to start in a hybrid model because that's what we would have to do to be in compliance with the state if we don't get permission to start an offsite. Um, or it, it furthers our case for um, if we wanted to start in that offsite environment because of those factors we talked about before, uh, it still allows us to do that and um, potentially have a, a stretch of time that we had looked at similarly um, prior, to, prior to the change in guidance from the governor. Um, and so really that review period would be about the same. We don't think we'll get a, a month long waiver. Um, they haven't given us any indication they would grant something that long. So if even if it's only two weeks, three weeks, um, this would delay the start of the school year a little bit for that time period about what our, uh, you know, concern is with the university students coming in. So offsite or otherwise, uh, it seems to make uh, some reasonable sense to our team about uh, delaying the start that way. And um, like I said, from our conversations with uh, Brady and the Teachers Association, um, I think they're, they're very supportive of that change as well. Well, the reason I guess I asked is because you have we have two calendars that are on there. And so just to be clear to everyone that's kind of following along, you're just talking about bringing the um, one that's labeled like. Uh, oh, I understand now what you're saying, Paul. Yeah, the second calendar would be if we would need to be in that hybrid model, that would just be having the A and the B days charted out. And so if we were going to start in an A, A B uh, wrote um, model, then then that one's just plotting out what those days would look like for families on the week to week basis. Um, so really, the one that would need to be changed is the start, the start and end dates. The other one is just kind of a information as we consider the hybrid model about how those days would rotate through. Of course, if we'd start in an offsite model, then we would rechart those days or see how we begin and make sure that that makes sense to begin, um, depending on the start date of when that on site instruction would take place in that rotation. Does that better answer your question? Sorry, I missed what you were talking about there. So Matt, um, you were saying that, you know, we would potentially do a vote on this next week if you get agreement from the board to proceed. But that also means that a public hearing has to be held next week as well. And that would give an opportunity for additional board questions as well as public questions um, at that point, because next week is a special meeting, and so it doesn't have community comments. So that's when folks that's watching now could raise their hand and ask questions, correct? Yes, thanks for drawing uh, attention to that, Ruthina. That's right. And that's, that's why we'd have the public hearing. So even though it's a special meeting and we don't do community comment during that time, that would be the uh, portion where people could comment. And of course, the board could still have conversation on it too, uh, then before the vote. Now, is there any mechanism um, or can we give any thought discussion to collecting those questions in advance? Um, because we'll be answering those questions like on the spot and it may be something that I, I would hate for us uh, to get to that level of, well, we don't know. And so if there's a lot of those questions with the, well, we, we're not certain, um, how can we handle that so we can, so the public can be as informed as possible? Sure, I would say as we get um, questions or if, if people uh, submit questions to you guys throughout the week or if we receive questions or the questions we already um, know could be potential issues. I mean, those were some of the things I tried to talk through tonight, but we could also bring those up again. We could take the additional questions we receive the next week and be prepared to just answer those in the onset of the discussion about, about that so people hear hear those answers and concerns. And so we know this is a big change uh, for our community, you know, that, like I said, is typically uh, used to starting in August. Um, you know, I do think there's benefit to June days in this particular situation in comparison to August days, um, which we wouldn't usually think about. Um, sometimes we think of those June days as a little bit more difficult for teaching and learning, but in this current environment we're in, there could be some benefit to having those days in June instead of August right now too. Amen. Okay, promise, oh, sorry. 
One final question, Janet, I promise. And this is just for next year. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean future calendars will be on this same schedule, correct? And then I'm done. <laughs> No, I think you're exactly right. I don't, I don't think we anticipate any long-term change to the calendar. This is really a one-year example that we'd look at to deal with the, with the pandemic. Um, so thank you. I was just going to build on Ruthina's questions around gathering community input. Can we do just a quick Qualtrics survey out to parents and just say support or don't support a late start and give a reason why? I mean, just real quick to get some data collection. I'm, I'm afraid that I know, I know we've got a lot of community members who are following this very closely, um, but just to try to be as comprehensive as we can about collecting that data, it's just a question. I know there's a lot going on. Yeah, I don't know. I would probably just uh, ask any of the team members about if they think we could turn that around. I, th I don't think the problems in building the Qualtrics survey, um, that could be pretty quick, like you said, Janet, putting that together. I think it's probably just communicating it out and we would have it open for a pretty short window of time. Um, so the amount of feedback might be different, but um, just be I don't think there's any reason we probably couldn't do that. Um, you know, like you said, from a thumbs up, thumbs down perspective in that regard. And, and try to make sure we get all of our, as many of our communities and, and populations and groups as possible, you know, into this dialogue, I think would be helpful. Yeah, I was gonna. The, that was the one thing I was in my head was uh, don't don't wait until you know next Tuesday at a public hearing if you have questions. Right? If you have a question today, you can start typing it in an email right now. Right? And and we will get that answer to you. So I, I'm sure that as soon as uh, you know the folks that are listening uh, tell their friends that uh, this is a topic, and as soon as uh, it's you know out in the news, we will get questions. So that's just my my plea out there, don't wait until Tuesday and ask them all in a public hearing, get them out as soon as we can so we can make sure that we're doing all of our due diligence and you know what changing a calendar actually means and making sure that we have answered those questions ahead of time to Ruthina's point. And I'm sorry, this isn't a question, but <laughs> I, I'm just curious. Well, it is a question. Um, it, I just realized Governor Reynolds is having a press conference on Thursday. Do we know anything about, and it's the topic is return to learn. Um, do we know what's any hint? I think I, I think I just found out that when I was in the middle of trying to explain to you guys when we anticipated that was going on, I saw my phone uh, light up over here with the notification and that was that the press conference would be Thursday at 11. So um, it sounds like maybe we'll know something Thursday and we can be more well informed uh, by Tuesday, it'd be ideal if we could get that turnaround on that. We'd have some calendar feedback back. Um, I will say, I think it's, you know, we've continued to talk about um, where our, our teachers and staff are at on this. Um, if, if we don't do something with the calendar, looking at the turnaround and if we're on site, I do think that'll be a, dif a difficult piece for us uh, with some of that uh, the staffing puzzle to put together based on the amount of students that we do think will enroll into that K-12 online learning program. So. Um, not the only reason to consider it or do it, but I think that's a, a big reason for us to also bring it to you along with uh, the part we talked about at the beginning about the obvious influx um, and the, the drive around health and safety around uh, not knowing what that's going to potentially do to our community and from the health department's um, support for our offsite decision at first. And so if that's denied or we're not allowed to do something in that time period, um, you know, I think the calendar question becomes a little bit more important for us. But um, I think we're hearing your feedback here around what we can do to try to get some quick turnaround on feedback um, and, and present that to you along with trying to address those questions as we get to that uh, next week. Yeah, I, 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 thanks for that, Matt. And I, I just want to say I support this later start. I think we do need more time to get ready um, for whatever option we're supporting or options. And I think that prep time plus that more information around how the community is responding with influx of students. I just, I, I think there's a lot of good reasons for extending that time and appreciate the thought the team put forward at proposing that. Matt, this is Brady. Just to jump in um, and affirm that, and I appreciate the collaboration we had with um, the district leadership teams on this. And we happened to be in uh, an ICEA leadership meeting uh, when we started to go back and forth. And so, uh, the leadership teams of ICEA do support this uh, change to the calendar. And I, um, I think one of the things that we've realized is that with the governor's proclamation on the 17th, we'd build a lot of collective energy and momentum around the plan that we still feel very strongly about uh, in a good way. 
but when you know when that changed and our models uh, had to change accordingly potentially at least that does reset your system a little bit and there had been considerable work done around our continuum and so you know having the ability to work through just some of the staffing things some of the what it means for teaching and learning if we we're in a, a different hybrid than we had spent a lot of time on uh, I can tell you from the perspective of the teachers having you know two weeks to work as teams after we find out what you know the waiver process is like and where we sit with that is uh, great it would be greatly appreciated uh, so Matt, this is Charlie. I've seen a lot of questions uh, from people already about uh, uh, sports team schedules and some of the other activities uh, uh, schedules that might be affected by a later start date. I'm sure you guys will put uh, that information in your uh, in your communication this before we get to next week's board meeting. Yeah, um, we're going to actually spend some time on athletics and activities as part of the update here tonight and how. Uh, a calendar change may or may not affect that at all um, with athletics and activities, Charlie. So okay. uh, all right. we can cover that here in that portion too um, and make sure that that's noted. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. I'll just throw my two cents in on the calendar. I, mean, I think that uh, most of us have said at one point or another that, you know, in-person learning is probably the most effective way to teach our kids and we want to do that, but we have struggled with how do we do that um, and ensuring the health and safety of our students and our staff, right? And I think that a calendar change in my head gives us the chance to have at least a couple more weeks of in-person learning at the end of the year that we may have, you know, not been able to do. So I think that increases what our end goal is, you know, to have in-person learning be you know what we're at you know at the by the end of the year for sure um so i, I that's the part that uh, resonates with me the most on it Matt, are you going to talk about e registration at all or can i ask a question on that yeah no that's one of our items tonight and so maybe just to give you guys a rundown um in case you have questions that aren't going to be uh, considered in that. A couple items we plan to take here are going to be um, staff intention survey that we conducted this week and some of the staff information, uh, information around enrollment, e-registration, an overview of our PK-12 online learning program, um, a general statement around testing capabilities and how we're exploring uh, partnership with the UA, UIHC on that, and then the athletics and activities conversation. So that's kind of a brief overview of where we're going next. Uh, this evening and part of this conversation. I think we just need to get into it, Matt, so, so people uh, know what questions they'll still have left at the end because they are kind of coming in from the, the chat and the Q&A and even board members, right? So I think we kind of just need to get into stuff and we can ask questions as we go. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chase and he's going to uh, take the uh, part around the communication we've done with staff here over the last week. Good evening. Nice to be with everybody this evening. And um, so as Matt said, I'm just going to give you a brief overview on some of the um, feedback loop we've had with, with our staff with regard to our two models. Uh, off the top, I just want to let the board know that um, the survey link doesn't actually close until this Friday. And so next week during our special meeting, we'll provide some charts and some graphs with some more detail about what we're hearing from our staff. I do want to give you some broad talking points tonight. Uh, the survey has been open for less than a week and, and what we ask um, our staff was around their comfort level in coming back to their current position uh, as, it, as, it, as it now sits, if we were in a all offsite model or uh, their comfort level if we were in the hybrid model that, that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. And as of noon today, we've had an 80% uh, return rate from our staff. That's about um, of 1,750 people that have uh, completed the survey. We're happy with that rate so far, but again, it's open for a few more days. And so uh, we hope that number continues to increase. Not surprisingly, over 90%, 95% of our staff uh, were comfortable with the idea of continuing in their current role if we um, started in a completely offsite model. When we asked them about returning to their position in the hybrid model, only 60% of staff said they were currently comfortable returning in that fashion. 
after those two questions, we asked one more question about whether or not uh, staff would like to have a conversation or consider having a conversation with an HR representative about potential leave options or workplace accommodation. And 13% of our staff, about 200 people that responded and said they would like some more information about those options from HR. And so that's a, that's a significant um, number of, um, of our employees. And I've used the word staff when we look more specifically um, at our teacher group. And again, we'll break this down in more detail after we have the final counts uh, at next Tuesday's meeting. It's very similar. Um, almost right at that 60% of our, of our teachers said they'd be comfortable coming back in that hybrid model and 13% said that they would um, indicate that they'd like to talk to HR about some um, options. Now we talked about leave and accommodations, about a third of those 200 individuals said they were interested in exploring a potential leave for this year and two thirds were interested in looking at workplace accommodations or in teaching in one of our online programs. Um, 200 is uh, a number that um, for the size of our HR staff would be a pretty large undertaking. And so our first step in order to get back to our employees quickly is we're going to set up a couple of informational sessions for those individuals at the end of this week and beginning next week. Nick and Jeremy are working along with Brady on uh, putting some information together to share. We have two sessions set up this week and a third if we need it set up for next week. And so we'll reach out to those individuals. We did collect their contact information as part of that survey and say, you know, you, you indicated that you'd like more information on a potential leave of absence or an accommodation. We'd like to invite you to this meeting to get some general information. And then from there, we'll set up some more one-on-one -on -one consultations after we're able to provide some more general information to all of those individuals. Um, Matt's talked about both the, um, the calendar and then also the hybrid model a little bit tonight. And so our next step with our employees is that once we solidify both the start date and, and the model, we wanna go back out to this roughly 40% that said they weren't uh, currently comfortable with the uh, hybrid approach and ask them if they are willing to come back in their current position. And you might say, well, Chase, why didn't you just do that in the first place? Well, um, you know, work choice is important. And we think that the comfort level of our employees, providing a supportive environment, providing a positive workspace is, is critical to us as a, as a district. And we want to hear what our employees have to say and have to share. So it was important for us to gauge their comfort level with the scenarios as we started to build them out to know where our pressure points are and what we needed to look at doing um, in terms of when we start, in terms of what accommodations, uh, in terms of what health and safety measures we might be able to put in place uh, to help make them feel more comfortable with the, um, with the current arrangement. So that was our first step. And so why we wanna do it in, in two phases, the second time to go back and ask if they're willing is because we also know that we have an amazing staff that's dedicated to our students and to our community and so that, that uh, we, you know, we want to know, like, we understand that these are the safeguards that are in place. We understand you're not comfortable necessarily with um, the approach we are having to take as we start this school year, but are you willing to come back to your position? And I know it's a more operational question, and that's why we want to do it in two phases. To first um, set, you know, that tone and that supportive culture and, 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 and focus on that piece right now, and then switch into that, okay, we now need to make some staffing decisions. So we'll go back out to our staff again uh, in the next week or so and really get down to that question so we can uh, start making some decisions about how we're going to staff school in our models when we, um, when we come back together in two weeks. That's a very quick overview, but um, again, I apologize that we don't have any graphics for you tonight, but um, we didn't wanna put anything up that we might have to change later given that the survey is still open and people still have an opportunity to apply. For our employees and, uh, that are out there that haven't taken the survey, please do. We're interested in your feelings about the, uh, the two models and also your comfort level in returning and if there are things that we can do um, as a system to support you as we all come back to work this fall. Um, I'll pause there and, and take any questions from the board. Well, Chase, this is Charlie. Uh, does the survey uh, information uh, allow us to look at the, what students in the district, what student populations uh, may or may not have uh, uh, t teaching and other staff may or may not be interested in or not interested, may not be uh, able to come back and teach groups of students um, or in particular buildings. 
so we can get an idea, some, you know, some idea of uh, if there are specific uh, uh, student populations that we will be uh, needing to really pay attention to in terms of returning staff to them. So, yes, the survey will give us an idea. It, Charlie, it will take some individual follow-up conversations. Um, when we ask for contact information, we also ask for building location. And so we know where the uh, staff members are located, teachers and support staff that have indicated um, they're not currently comfortable with returning to their current role or have asked to speak with HR about leave um, or an accommodation. So yes, we can um, drill it down to the building level, um, the classroom level in all honesty to look and see where some of those uh, gaps could be created or we might have um, staffing concerns. And you'll have that information for us when you come back, is that, is that right? Um, we can talk about that. I, I, we, I, I, we can, I don't know if we talked about breaking it down by percentage of uh, staff in each building that are comfortable coming back, but um, we were probably gonna keep it more at that employee group level. Um, but um, it's something definitely we can look at how we want to disaggregate it. Okay. And then Chase, you, I was wondering about the, the secondary versus elementary. Or is right. it kind of an even spread there? Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at it. I haven't sliced the data that way, Sean, but um, believe me, those are all pieces we're going to look at because these all go into the staffing uh, puzzle. When we look at staffing our onsite programs in addition to the new online program that, uh, that, that is actually really cool and that Amy's gonna talk to us about in a little bit. We, we have to have a, a, a very clear understanding about where these, um, uh, where the, the comfort level is by building, by grade level, by subject area, by certification. <clears throat> um, and so it becomes pretty complex as we try to, to put it all together and find um, not only spaces for um, all of our staff, but to ensure that we have all the sections we need covered in the different models that, that we're going to run this year. And I was yeah. just gonna chime in, Chase, if you don't mind, to sure. kind of respond to Charlie's question there a little bit. I think one thing, it might be a little premature next Tuesday, Charlie, to get to some of that information, because at this point, we're just getting indications that a number of people wanna to talk to the HR team. So Jeremy and I will be working with Folks, I mean, a lot of times it may just be understanding their options, understanding what you know could be available, might be available. So I don't know that we'd be accurate in saying, well, these buildings look like they might have more people less available than another building. So I think it, it'll be difficult by next Tuesday to say that. I think we'll have general trends and we'll maybe be able to look at what Sean asked about secondary versus elementary, where those are, but to really drill down into it, <clears throat> maybe to the degree that we're thinking of, that'll be kind of much, it'll, a little further in the process as we work through it with each person and, and the different teams. Okay, thanks, Nick. And uh, maybe I could uh, ask for something a little bit different. And that is a, uh, an indication of what uh, uh, what strategies you'd like us to follow if there, if it turns out that there were to be significant gaps in uh, 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 in staff to, uh, working with certain you know with particular buildings or so forth, and if if, if it turns out that it's, it's uh, staff is interested in coming back fairly uniformly across the district, uh, that's great. We don't have to worry about it. But if it doesn't turn out, then maybe we we'll have to have some idea of where we're going, how we're going to address that. Charlie, that's a that's a good question, and and, and we've and we've started to to talk about it, and so there's, um, I think Matt uh, Nick's right that it's that it's premature, but you've asked the question, and um, the answer is not going to change if we give it to you tonight, or um, or next week. But you know, it's the same conversation we have every year when we talk talk about staffing that um, staffing has a direct impact on class size. And so if we find ourselves in a spot where we don't have enough teachers to cover the classes as we now have them allocated, um, it's going to have an impact on the class size. Now, is that across the board? Is that in certain subject areas? Is that in certain grade levels? Those are all things that would have to be further discussed in more detail. But whenever we talk about staffing, it, it, is, it is closely tied to um, our, our, our class size conversations. 
that's what I was going to add in. And so part of this is like Chase said, right, that we'll have to put this staffing puzzle together uh, based on when we know some of those indications from uh, students, which we're going to connect this conversation to the next one around e-registration and feedback from students and families. And so the two are tied together, just like he said, around our ability to know where staff are at and their willingness to, to do that or the, what they're going to do as far as exploring other options. And then what kind of, I guess, when you ask about strategies, what we'll probably need from you guys is um, some flexibility around some of those superintendent directions around class size and knowing that as we operate in a fluid environment, um, even when we talk about the PK-12 online learning program, we're gonna have some fluidity throughout the year at different transition points. And so um, having those hard caps on class sizes we've been traditionally used to uh, will be somewhat untenable in a staffing situation this year as we look at those things, knowing that staff have increased needs um, and that we'll have to work through those. And then also knowing that we're gonna have to be able to create some fluidity for students uh, to move between models uh, in that sense as well. So that would just be a couple of things when you ask about what we might need from you. I think that'll be the, the thing we probably ask for is some increased flexibility around what those class size uh, limits and caps have traditionally been. Yeah, I appreciate your, your descriptions here. Thank you. Chase, quick question for you on the teacher survey. Um, and maybe I'm I'm just not understanding exactly your, your wording and you could have already said this, but was the first question or the question about them, their comfort level coming back, was it just comfort level or was it specifically asked about health? And the only reason I asked that is I'm just wondering if it was they're comfortable coming back uh, or not comfortable coming back because of health reasons or they're not comfortable coming back because they're unsure of what's the model or what the teaching style or what is gonna be um, for, the, for the teacher coming back. Sure. So the first question was, um, was if we were an offsite, would you just be comfortable continuing your, in your current position? And, um, and it didn't give a lot of detail. Paul, the second question, when we talked about the hybrid, we gave a little bit more detail. We, we talked a little bit that there would be some uh, PPE, in, PPE in place and that um, teachers and other staff would be expected to be in the building every day half the students would be in the building each day. And so then said, you know, would knowing those dynamics, would you feel comfortable um, coming back or continuing in your current in your current position? And if they clicked no, they they were taken to a screen that gave them an opportunity. Um, I think there were five or six different choices that they, they could pick to tell us really what what was driving their answer. I don't have that answer tonight, Paul, but we'll definitely share that next week. And then the, the, the final question was the one about, would you want to speak with HR about a possible um, um, accommodation or, or potential leave of absence? So we did gather some of that information about what was behind, what driving their answer about being uncomfortable to come back in the hybrid. Uh, I, just, I, I just don't have that, that detail tonight. So I, I think if there's no other questions on this one, I, I know that we've had uh, several parents ask and, and uh, families ask how they now feel about the situation that we conducted that initial uh, parent survey. And then with our obvious recommendation uh, to start the year offsite, as we looked at those data points early in June, as Chase just talked about trying to get some additional information from staff. We also know it's important to get additional information from our families, but as we talked about at the board meeting last week, uh, the time frame on doing that and the time frame we're up against with uh, registration, uh, we felt it was best to try to get some of the, that information just through that e-registration process and essentially do both at once. Um, and so Amy's going to walk you through the e-registration process and enrollment uh, that we're looking at here and how we'll be able to grab some of that data and also start to tie these two conversations together like Chase um, was laying out to you there about the staffing and then also the um, students and class sizes and, and where the students might land as far as their choices go, even though we know we have uh, still some lack of clarity surrounding that. Matt, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be able to share with you what we plan to uh, share with families tomorrow. So what I'm sharing this evening isn't live yet on our website. Um, there will be an email that goes out to our families tomorrow um, that 
details all of these pieces. So what you're seeing right now is our enrollment and register. Um, in here, we also, we're giving a nod right away on the landing page to the fact that um, we will be working that continuum from offsite to hybrid to onsite, and that is linked there. And then we also are making mention of the new ICCSD PK-12 online learning program. And that link will take parents to a landing spot that will um, greater detail the program and we will be doing that as well in a little bit. In the upper right hand corner, families have a choice then to select whether they have new students to the district or returning students. And in the new students section, uh, we have tabs for preschool, kindergarten, and grades one through 12, as each of these um, groups is slightly different in the requirements um, for enrollment and registration purposes. I'm gonna give the example or walk you through the example of a family that would be enrolling a new first through 12th grade student. All right, so you see three steps that are outlined here. And essentially these three steps are similar for both new and re returning students, but they vary slightly. So with our new students, we talk to our family's account, um, completing and turning in forms and paying fees. And I'm gonna expand the view so that you can see what we're sharing with our parents. I'm Right here that we um, share that PowerSchool accounts must be created and families must walk through a process known as e-registration. Right away then you see um, a couple of options put in front of parents. And we say that during the e-registration process, families will have the opportunity to choose between the following. Standard enrollment, which could be shifting in that continuum between off-site, hybrid, and on-site model or the PK-12 online learning program. And again, it's linked there for families. Um, we also attach um, some information regarding how to create a PowerSchool account, provide some language around what to bring to on-site registration, verification of birthday, immunization record, proof of residency and transcripts. We have a link to our help us. And then we offer up the dates and times for both elementary and secondary on-site registration. And our intent this year is to keep traffic as low as possible. And hence the reason we've brought most of this online and tried to really um, make clear the three steps that we have here. Um, elementary parents will have the ability to go in and sign up for an appointment. And we're offering registration over two days, August 4th and 6th, um, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. In the form section, we have families must submit multiple forms for enrollment and, re and registration of a new student. I'm gonna show you that all of the forms that are linked here that a family would need. And you can see that they're translated into six other languages as well. Just a quick peek over there. We've also given a nod to the immunization requirements and the free and reduced online meal application. Some of those items that you see in red there, we're still collecting. That will be done by tomorrow. And then our last step is pay, the payment of fees. So this uh, area um, provides families with directions on um, logging into the web store where they can do that. It's the ICCSD landing page for um, a system known as RevTrack. Um, 
there's some protocols or prompts right there for families. And then there's um, our school fees are attached for the 2021 school year. I'm gonna go back out and then just give you a glimpse of how returning student page differs a little bit. Again, you see the three steps. And this time, when we talk about PowerSchool, we're asking families to update their current accounts. We provide directions in there as well. We also make it clear to families that when they're uh, registering that they will have the option to either enroll their student in standard enrollment or the PK-12 online program. There's a section for forms again, although our returning families, um, there are very few forms that they may have to turn in. If they've moved across the district, maybe proof of residency there, an update around immunization records. We know that students in seventh and 12th grade are required to have additional shots. The online uh, free and reduced meal application is there as well. And then the fees section looks exactly the same that we just walked through. So with that, I would take questions. So Amy, uh, quick question. When parents are opting into the um, online uh, model where, is there any explanation on like, is this year long or just until this thing ends, whenever that may be? What, what do they see when they click that? Great question, we're gonna go there next. So can we see if there's any other questions about e-registration? Absolutely. Forms, and then we'll, then we'll jump over there. Great question Thank right you. there because we do answer that. So last week we discussed a e-registration option that would say, if the waiver is granted, I want to enroll in the standard ICCSD enrollment package, understanding that I would start off-site. If the waiver is not granted, then I want to be moved over to the online school. I did not see that as an option. Why did we decide not to go forward with that? Right, Lisa, we were thinking about doing that, and that would have been option C for us or option three. Um, we debated about that, but what you'll see over in the PK-12 online learning program is um, a deadline for enrollment into the program. And we put that deadline, um, we believe, far enough out that we'll have an answer uh, back from the Department of Ed regarding uh, whether we're, we have the ability to start in remote or if we'll have to start in that hybrid model. So uh, over there on that page, you'll see that we detail August 9th as that date. Uh, and so we're going to allow families, of course, to go in and um, change their opinion on that if we receive information that um, would, want, would make them want to change their mind. If we haven't received that information by August 9th, do we have the ability to extend that deadline? Other questions around enrollment, e-registration, on-site registration? Amy, I think you addressed Lisa's question, but we didn't hear it, so maybe if you could try it again. Your internet's a little choppy there at times, so I don't know if you want to maybe turn your video off too, but if you want to give another shot to Lisa's question there. Sorry, Lisa. I was saying that um, we did consider having option C or option three like you detailed there earlier. Um, we really came back to, um, we, we had a lot of conversation around that and decided not to do it that way. In the PK-12 online learning program and the web pages, you'll see that we put a date um, on there for our families and we asked families to make that selection by August 9th. And if we have, um, we, we believe that we'll have um, the answer back from the Department of Ed prior to that time, whether we're going to be allowed to start in remote or in that hybrid situation. And so that will give parents time then to change their mind once they know um, how we intend to begin the school year. 
Um, I, I think Lisa asked a follow up and that was if, you know, we don't know that by August 9th, could we extend that deadline? And the answer to that is absolutely, we would do that. So when does registration officially open? It will open tomorrow. We'll, we intend to send the email out to families um, by the end of the day tomorrow. And is there an, an actual close date other than the date where you kind of want people to make a decision or does it just stay open while we're trying to make sure we get everybody registered? It, it really needs to stay open. I think I shared last week that um, in a typical school year, we struggle to have 100% of our e-registrations even complete um, as we, at, during opening day. So oftentimes we find students sitting in our seats whose families haven't updated um, PowerSchool and e-registration. So we continue to work on that you know, all year long. And um, e-registration technically has to be open. Of course, we're enrolling families at any time uh, during the course of the school year. So Amy, how does a student choose which class to go to if they're if their parents haven't registered them. Elementary, they will show up in our buildings and they are, um, these are typically, uh, these are students that would have been former students. Their families just haven't gone in and e-registered them. I'm not sure what happens at the secondary if they walk in without having e-registration done. I do know at the secondary, of course, that um, students are um, registering for courses in the winter. And so they're probably assuming that that course load that they assigned, uh, signed up for in the winter is um, they're in their PowerSchool accounts, I would assume, seeing if they're still signed up for those particular courses. And Scott or Matt, correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, Scott, you can jump in here if you want to, but same thing, they would show up at, the, um, at their attendance center and then we would help them um, get complete what we need to get complete into power school, get them a schedule and, and get those necessary pieces taken care of and get them started. So um, that's oftentimes what happens. Like Amy said, our usual push is to try to get that registration number as high as we can. Uh, oftentimes the elementaries end up with a higher percentage of the secondary uh, from the onset of that. And then we, we work to get students uh, finished up and into schedules and into school just as soon as we can as they present to us. Yeah, so Charlie, at the secondary level, that mostly lays at the feet of the registrar and the counselors. Okay, thanks. What, um, nope, oh, sorry, can I interrupt somebody? I was just going to ask if we could get an update at next week's uh, special meeting on how many students have, or how many families have opted into the online option. Sure, what? we can do that. Uh, a couple of questions. What's the minimum amount of time we want folks in the online option? And then what are the transition points where, where uh, families could decide they want to switch back or switch to the continuous learning model? Yeah, so Amy's next part here is a, a full overview of that online part, uh, JP, but a quick answer is we're really looking for a, a trimester commitment on the outset, but we'll let the team get into some more details on that too that might address that a little greater detail than I just provided there. All right, I'm gonna start my video again. Hopefully this works okay. I'm gonna share my screen so that I can walk you through the web um, pages and the website that we've developed for the PK-12 online learning program. All right, so the way that this is set up is um, we have several tabs here. First page is the online overview. Next page is about how to enroll. Academics, ICCSD online PK-12 course catalog, special services, extra and co-curricular experiences, and frequently asked questions. I'm gonna take the first two and then you're gonna hear tonight from Diane and Scott and Adam as well. So on the first page where we're trying to provide a broad overview about what the program is about, um, we talk about the fact that it provides a high quality at home alternative to the traditional setting. And it's designed by district teachers and administrators. And that we recognize that we um, have families that are concerned about health and safety and community at large as well. And that the online um, program provides parent a choice um, for a consistent online experience 
for the entire year, or like Matt noted, at least for a trimester. Um, it, individual learning is the key component, individualized learning. There's uh, uh, the daily and weekly course load will you know, be dependent on the grade level the student is enrolled in and the courses that they are. However, it's designed to really try and replicate what a typical workload would be with our in-person day. There's a combination of synchronous and asynchronous opportunities um, with special care taken that we don't overlap um, any courses or classes in the student's schedule. Um, while the online learning environment, um, it will provide still some social interaction with teachers and peers. At the elementary level, they'll have classes that, that meet every day and um, opportunities for some small group instruction uh, with their peers as well. Some of that will be asynchronous, however, and students and families will access that through either Seesaw or Canvas, depending on the level. At the secondary, um, the same will, would, be, would hold true that I just shared with elementary, although some of the classes will be offered through Edgenuity. And Adam, or I can't remember, Diane, maybe uh, one of them will speak more at length about what Edgenuity will, will be able to offer. Um, the school calendar will be followed just like the rest of the district so that school calendar doesn't change for our families. Um, we will be publishing both the, all three schedules tomorrow as well, what the preschool online program would look like, the schedule it would follow, as well as elementary and secondary. You've seen the preschool and the elementary schedules in the past, and we're making some slight changes to the secondary as we speak. Uh, students would take a typical amount of classes at the elementary, both core courses and specials classes will be offered. And at the secondary, uh, students would be asked to take at least five classes with the exception of seniors who can ask to take four. I'm gonna jump to the enrollment tab, which we've talked about a little bit already over in the enrollment and registration site. But again, we detail here those two options that we would have seen on that page. So option A is the standard uh, enrollment, although we know that we could be operating within this continuum this year. So we certainly wanted to give a nod to that. And then option B is enrolling into the online program. We go on to further ask parents to make their selection no later than August 9th. And again, to Lisa's question, we can be flexible with that depending on how quick of a turnaround you might be getting from the Iowa Department of Ed. After that, we ask that parents then, um, we reserve the right to not make it those changes um, until the end of the trimester, the beginning of the next trimester. It's an imperative that we're able to operate in that um, mode for staffing purposes. The next section details that we will get back to families between August 14th and 17th. And while they are guaranteed a spot in the program, um, things that we can't guarantee right away is what that exactly looks like. So at the elementary level, of course, depending on enrollment, classes could run as a, as a typical straight grade, like first grade section. But if enrollment was lower in say third and fourth grade, maybe we have to run a combination classroom in that regard. And at the secondary level, enrolling in the online program during e-registration doesn't guarantee a student will be in the class that they selected in the spring if it was a non-core class, if we didn't have enough enrollment there to run that course. And then the last piece just also shares with parents that um, although students will be placed in this online environment with teachers and students from across the district, they will still be enrolled in their home school attendance area. And that's gonna become important later when we also talk about extracurricular and co-curricular activities. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Diane next. The one, I just wanna jump in with one thing there, Amy. I think one thing probably just to uh, draw your attention to and to echo to the parents is really the consistency part of this experience. Um, that no, I know there'll be questions about how we start and how that'll affect the initial decision, but I think 
there needs to be some acceptance, um, you know, for uh, families and students and obviously our staff that just because we start in a certain model doesn't mean we're going to stay in that model and the, um, that, that things can ebb and flow throughout the year. And so if consistency is something that a, a family and student is seeking, then obviously this is one that would continue on and there wouldn't be those transition points uh, depending on what's happening uh, in the community with the uh, potential spread of the um, of the virus or not. And so um, that would be one thing, you know, that would be a driver for people wanting to make this choice if they don't want to be in that back and forth uh, component of it. Not, you know, obviously there's other factors for why they'd want to choose this option too, but I do think that's one thing to probably draw people's attention to because I know there'd be a lot of questions at the beginning of, well, how are you going to start, you know, and, and how that might influence the decision. But I think, you know, the, the long-term part of that too is recognizing that it could be a back and forth a scenario in some of our buildings or even the district, uh, depending on, on how things trend for us over the course of the year. So just wanted to get that in there. I'll let Diane kind of take over on the academics portion now. Good evening, everyone. Um, the academics portion really just goes into a little more detail um, of what Amy gave in the overview just a, a minute ago. I do want to point out, though, that we've been Kind of considering this online learning program for a couple of years. Two years ago, the Iowa legislature gave school districts the um, option of developing an online learning program. So um, Adam Kurth really took the lead on that and he's been really helping us think about how this could work in our district for a couple of years. Um, it was kind of put on hold for a little bit, but um, COVID brought it back to life. So um, fortunately, we had quite a bit of this kind of already set up and we were able to revive that and, and put it back to use. So we were able to just recently um, ask our teachers, invite our teachers this summer to apply to create curriculum for this online program. So we have asked and we received quite a few applications from our ICCSD um, pre-K-12 teachers and they are currently undergoing um, some training in how to develop online programs and then starting to create an online course. Um, so we've hired teachers per course. So we've got them at the elementary, at the junior high, at the high school, uh, and they're working to develop this. So we really think it's gonna be a very rigorous um, program that's gonna really match what we currently teach within our schools as well. In addition to that, we also have kind of in our back pocket, the Edgenuity program. Edgenuity is a purchase curricular program that we've been using for four years in kind of a small format for those students who might need to um, get credit recovery for a course that they may have failed, or maybe a student that might um, have a scheduling conflict and has to take a course online. So it's been kind of a limited use in our building, um, but now we can expand that as well. So we've got the Edgenuity courses for, for any course that maybe we don't have teachers currently um, on staff who are ready to create that online course for us, we can dip kind of into the Edgenuity bucket and um, use some of those courses as well. So we're gonna have quite a variety of courses for, for kids to be able to enroll in. Um, as Amy said, we really think that um, some of the benefit of, of us doing it within the district is we can offer some synchronous learning opportunities. So it won't just all be asynchronous where the kids are just kind of working through videos or online lessons that we will have live teachers that are meeting with kids and helping them understand the content. So we're really proud of that piece. Um, and we have some schedules like Amy had kind of referenced and Amy, I'm not sure if you wanna click on one of those links there where it says schedule or, or week. So we can look at the schedules and like Amy said, you've seen the, the elementary schedule that we've shared with you in the past. And just so parents kind of have an understanding of what that looks like, we really were conscious of how much time a student might be online. So we wanted to make sure that that was limited um, according to their age level or appropriate for their age level. And also that we wanted to make sure that it was really focused on those critical areas. So we would follow this program um, or this schedule here at the elementary. So we would anticipate that the kids would have an opportunity to have a class meeting. So we really wanna make sure we have those social activities for those kids. So they would have a classroom and they would have classmates that they could meet um, and you know, communicate with every day um, in, during that class meeting. Then we would also make sure that there was some core language arts that that might be either a video um, synchronous 
or a synchronous session that the teachers would be teaching and then there would be some small group reading opportunities for kids. We would have core math instruction and we would have some small group math instruction for kids. And then we might also have um, some, we would have specials. So students would be able to um, look at that. And um, I'm sorry, they would be able to have their specials where they would have um, art, music, PE, um, counseling, library sessions, like once a week. So they would have those teachers to be able to, to provide that for them as well. So we really think it would be a really well-rounded program. And then in the afternoon, we would provide those opportunities for some um, learning around science and social studies and health topics as well. So um, again, really proud of that program. And we've got teachers that are working on that at the elementary level. At the junior high and high school level, um, we've got just some sample courses or some sample schedules there as well. So we've got um, just the idea that we're looking at making sure that, again, the students are just spending um, limited amount of time in online activities. So we've set that up so that they would spend maybe one day Mondays in synchronous activities with their periods one through four courses. And then they'd have the afternoon off for those asynchronous learning time. And then on Tuesdays, they would start with asynchronous learning and then have the afternoon where they would spend time in their five through seven or five through eight periods. And um, we've had to kind of adjust that from something maybe we had shared with you earlier because we wanted to make sure that it matched up as closely as possible to the on-site schedules that our um, teachers would be teaching in. Because we know that uh, we may have some teachers let's say a chemistry teacher who might be teaching some courses on site and might also be teaching a course or two, a section or two through this online program. So we wanted to make sure that the teacher was able to kind of move back and forth between the two. That's why those schedules might look a little different than the last time that you saw those. Um, the other thing I just really wanted to point out is with this program, the students are getting our curriculum taught by our teachers. So they're getting our credit. So their transcripts will look exactly the same as if they were taking courses on site. They will be able to have any course that they need to graduate. So we shouldn't have any lag or any problems with students graduating with an ICCSD diploma. So I'm gonna turn it over to Scott now just to talk about the courses that we are um, hoping to be able to offer. Thanks, Diane. Amy, will you uh, bounce me over to the elementary page? Awesome, thank you. So um, as Diane said, every last thing that's on this page is being developed by Iowa City Community School District teachers. And so it's a, it's a nice group of 30, 40 staff members that are working to develop first grade curriculum and second grade curriculum. And as you can see, everything that's on there, including preschool. Um, so again, all of that developed by Iowa City School District teachers. And then, you know, based on the earlier conversation about where staffing uh, turns out, um, some staff will be teaching in an online environment based on the number of kids that are enrolled. So we'll just have to work all that out based on family decisions. Um, jump me to high school and then we'll go to uh, junior high only because there's more illustrations in high school, Amy. Okay, so at the high school level, um, it's sometimes it's a single teacher that's building a course. Most of the time, it's two teachers that have uh, teamed up to build a course. And in a few instances, there are three teachers. And we started offering just what I would call the core courses. So there are four courses in English because there's four years of English requirement. And um, today we released new, what we call phase two courses that can be developed. So even though it might say an E behind it right now, and I'll explain that in a moment, um, we hope that we're gonna start erasing more of those E's as we get more feedback from staff. So if we look at language arts, for example, English 9 is being developed by a team of two teachers. But AP English Language and Composition, at this point, we're promising that that'll be offered through Edgenuity. But we haven't offered it to our staff to develop it until this afternoon. And so if we have people that pick that up, then we'll be happy to take that E off of it and it won't be through Edgenuity. So anything with, edge, with an E behind it means that right now Edgenuity is our fallback. If it doesn't have an E, just like those elementary courses, 
they've been developed by school district personnel. So you can see they're in math as well. Algebra one and algebra two are being developed, but we don't have everything else covered in uh, math. We didn't release any AP courses to be developed until today. So just, just so that's clear, we, we're certain we're gonna get many of those people to do it and we'll keep updating that page. Um, maybe drag all the way down there to the bottom, Amy. I think there's some electives down there. There's Brady's social studies stuff. Sometimes um, folks reached out to us and said, we'd like to develop this course. And I think art is a perfect example of that. So the um, art team, the curriculum coordinator and, and uh, his colleagues decided that the three art courses at the high school level that would be most appropriate for an online setting are digital photography, drawing and graphic design. So that was nice that that art team kind of pulled together to make that decision. I think the last thing I'll say on the high school piece, and then we can go to the junior high piece, is that um, I've fielded some questions about how did some courses get on this list? Um, and essentially, we, we figured out whatever was in Edgenuity that matched a course within the school district, that's what we posted on the page. And so that way we can, we've kind of got two ways to deliver that um, course. So if it's a course like, oh, maybe an English elective like grammar that might not have an edgenuity pair, we don't have that listed there. But if a staff member in the district said, we'd like to, we'd like to produce grammar for you, then we'd add this in there. But the, the list of courses, again, were those courses that are offered in edgenuity that match something that we're doing at the school level. So Amy, jump me over to junior high and then I can take a few questions as well. Awesome. And it's the same thing that you saw at the high school level, except um, there just aren't near as many electives and uh, as broad a choice at the high school level as the junior high. So if you look at math, all those courses are being developed by school district teachers, pre-algebra seven, math seven and you can see that if you look at language arts language arts seven has an e behind it and that's because right now we don't have a staff member in the district that has raised their hand it doesn't mean that we haven't st uh, stopped recruiting folks we are recruiting folks all the time but at this point we don't have a school district person working on uh, language arts seven and that was part of our outreach as well today so I think I'm going to take a breath and ask if there were questions or Matt looks like maybe you were going to add something. Okay. Nope, you're good. You're okay. good. This is Janet. I don't have any questions really. I have a comment though, Diane and Scott. I'm really impressed with what you've put together here. Um, I know when we first voted to go online uh, and, and, and we talked about the need to, you know, step up and get these courses ready to go and make sure that the experience is rich for students. And I think, um, I think y'all are on the way to that. I, I love that we have so many teachers stepping in to take over building these courses and taking the E off the, the title, Scott, as you described it. Um, I just, I, I, I think we're going to see a lot of interest in our district for the online version, the online learning, online education. And um, I think this uh, richness coupled with a decision point at the, at the trimester level, I think, um, I think we're going to see this being a very popular option for families in our districts. And I just, and, and, and the work that y'all have done um, is just going to give people a lot of confidence for selecting this this piece. So I just want to thank the team for all the work you've put into that. Thank you, Janet. Really, the credit goes to the teachers. They are doing a lot of work. They are working their tails off. Um, so just really proud of them. Yeah. yeah no. oh, nice go ahead, Matthew. Go ahead. You guys go ahead. Well, I was going to, I just wanted to pick up from where Janet left off. Um, Jason and his co-teacher, Judith, they're doing the world history class online. So it's happening upstairs and I can just speak for them, but I know that the teachers are taking it super seriously and he's, he's doing a great job of pulling it together. And I think all the teachers in the district are probably who are working on it are doing that. And so I think these classes are going to be great. Um, I am not at all familiar with ingenuity um and i'm wondering if we could spend like if, if a student does take an ingenuity class is it all a 
distance learning or do they still have interaction with a live person at some point during the curriculum? Yeah, Adam was going to do that in the Q&A, but um, the Ingenuity course has to be assigned to a highly qualified teacher, which means they have to have licensure. So I was a former math teacher. I couldn't supervise a biology Ingenuity course. So um, those people that are supervising those courses will, their biggest responsibility will be the grading piece of that. Um, but they'll also have what I would describe as office hours, Lisa, that most of the content in Ingenuity is asynchronous, um, but there is a person assigned to them. There can be questions back and forth with that instructor. Um, it's a, it'll be different though than the ones that are being developed by the teachers. Those will have a lot more synchronous activities. And, and that was gonna be my next class question is the ones with our teachers, we would expect to kind of stick to that online schedule and have in-person instruction on a regular basis throughout the week? Yes, and we've tried to cap that at three or four hours based on the age of the students so that we're not I, I know how tired I get after a handful of hours on Zoom. We don't want kids doing seven hours worth of Zoom, right? So we've built some schedules so that we manage their screen time and at the same time have synchronous activities for the kids. And then back to Matt, when you say maybe one of the things you need for us from us is some flexibility for the superintendent directions on class sizes, is this part of it so that if we get 42 kids who want to take AP World History, we just still have one section online of AP World History? That's a part of it. I think when I made that comment at that portion of the meeting, what we were thinking through at that time, or at least where my head was at, was more at this trimester turn. So say we do get a high number of students that opt into this online learning program at the outset, and then they say, you know, we're comfortable now coming back on site we probably can't realistically create enough efficiency or drill down our staffing enough to make sure we meet all of those class size directives. Uh, we obviously don't want super large class sizes, but we've been pretty true to the rule that if we went one above or a couple above in some sections, you know, we've done something staffing related. We just won't have that flexibility to do that in the middle of the year with the volume of students we're, we're anticipating. But yes, here, obviously, we still have some class size um, you know, issues we'll work through. We don't see these classes necessarily being um, extremely large because of, of some of the components about how they look with asynchronous or synchronous. And so those class sizes, I don't think you'll see um, big differences there. Some of the ingenuity courses, since they're primarily asynchronous, might be staffed uh, a little higher in that sense. But um, some of the other courses in their delivery wouldn't necessarily have that trend. So more, Lisa, to that aspect about when we need to make changes based on you know, new students coming back to an on-site model, needing some flexibility there I think is key. Not with the intention of trying to drive up large class sizes, but just knowing we can't stay as true as we've been before. So more of a second try, third try. Yeah, and you know, and I think the, the realistic one is we start to put this together, we'll be coming back to you guys with that, you know, RAM conversation about how we even start. You know, once we know how many students are actually in this program and then where we're gonna have teachers placed, you know, what do our class sizes look at at that point? What's our best approach to do that? But the concern, yeah, I think, you know, I mean, at the outset, we'll, we'll be better able to maybe create some efficiency around that, but second and third try could be difficult. I know there's a question, um, or a question I, I had too that we want to come back to around the hybrid schedule uh, that people are thinking about, and so we'll talk uh, potentially a little bit about what that schedule could look like for kids during the day too, but um, if there's other questions for course Cal, we can take those now and get to a couple of these other items on the online learning program too. So just a quick question um, for our, well, never mind. I think we're getting ready to get in there for students receiving um, uh, special uh, services with IEP. So I'll hold off until we go through that one. I have a real quick question, Matt. I know we've, we've talked about, uh, you know, if people opt for the, the online learning program to try and um, hold true to a, a trimester to, you know, make sure we can do our staffing. What about the other direction if uh, folks send their, their kids and, and just, you know, the community spread is such that, you know, whatever metrics we're getting from our governor when we can make changes is not at the point where somebody feels comfortable and they want to pull their children out. Is that kind of, do they have the ability to do that at any time going the other direction? 
Well, I think what we need to uh, talk about there, Sean, is um, obviously having some of those metrics from the state about what that's going to look like and what they're going to allow us to do and then how that affects our local decision. And so the big picture on that one is, um, you know, based on maybe what we learn here Thursday or what that criteria looks like for when those temporary moves can happen, how fluid is that going to be? Um, you know, is there going to be great flexibility to exert in that situation or are those numbers going to have to be pretty high before they allow us to uh, exert flexibility between our models um, because that kind of changes the maybe scale of that question you're asking, right? Um, and so I think to that effect, though, if, if we get some um, discomfort from people in the middle of the try, um, it's still difficult for us to uh, probably move them in in that situation, not saying that we wouldn't uh, try to consider that for people, but we're really trying to get this on the front end as far as how we staff and do this uh, because we can't have an influx of people three weeks in uh, because we've positioned our staff to do that. And so that's why we're really trying to capture this, that if you don't like that fluidity or if you're not going to feel confident in maybe what those metrics are that hopefully we'll be able to share out with people and you don't want that transition or you don't trust maybe even those data points or those transition points that we're going to have to operate under, then this is your consistent experience. This is probably where you need to start and where you need to be. And so we want to give that message loud and clear because we, we don't have the luxury about being able to pull more staffing into this program once we start uh, based on some moves in the middle of a middle of a trimester. I know that's not super user friendly, but I think that's just the kind of the reality part we're into. No, I mean, I, I want to make sure that expectations are very clear for everyone because that's, you know, that's been a question of, you know, whatever choice we make, you know, how locked in are we? And I want people to be fully informed at the front end of how locked in they are. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I think we, we owe it to, um, you know, all of our staff and putting them in a place where they're going to be able to succeed and the students are going to be able to succeed to kind of know on the front end what uh, the intention is. But I, I think we, fluidity, I think, was the word you used earlier that we all have to just be mindful of that uh, we don't really know what's coming uh, tomorrow, let alone, you know, two months from now. So I think it's uh, good to have a good starting place and then adapt as we need to. So I appreciate the mm -hmm. answer. Quick question on junior highs. Uh, and maybe I missed it, but it went by pretty fast. But was there foreign language for eighth graders in the junior high model? So There's not, the, but the I world, think missed that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. The, <laughs> the world just, language is yeah. a high school course that's taken at the junior high. So the same high school course that will develop be developed at the high school junior high kids will be able to access. So we'll get that listed on there so that's more clear. So if we want to move on to special services then, we just wanted to um, highlight that this is really a robust, fully comprehensive online program and any service that um, students might be entitled to in an on-site program, they will have access to in this online program as well. So if students have IEPs, they are welcome to sign up for the online program. Um, we would know that, that um, their parents would, would have an IEP meeting. So they would just need to reach out to the building principal and we would bring the team together and we would just discuss what are the appropriate accommodations and supports that the student would need in order to be able to access the online learning. Um, all same for students with English language learner services, we would provide those. We would provide um, extended learning program or ELP services for any student who qualifies for that. And any student who might have a 504, um, we would just make sure that the accommodations listed in the 504 are appropriate for the online learning and adjust those as needed. So all services will be provided to these students. And then finally, um, if we move just to the extracurriculars, that's we just wanted to highlight that as well, that um, extracurriculars, whether they're sports or clubs or activities, would also be open to the students to participate in as any other student would be able to participate as well. So, um, you know, we're hoping that some of those can be offered virtually for kids, um, but obviously um, anything that might be open or available to any of our on-site students would also be available to these students. Um, and that's why, you know, we talked earlier about the students enrolling kind of in their home school. So they would participate in those clubs and activities with their home school as well.
And then Adam, if you want to hit the FAQs. All right, so one of the things that we thought would be useful would be to try to anticipate some of those questions that we would get. And we know that we'll get more and we will be adding those common questions to this page um, with, with the answers as they come in. Um, but we really tried to distill a lot of the information from the other pages into specific questions that would be of interest to, um, to families, to students, uh, and to others in the community. So um, I won't go through all of these questions specifically um, since we've talked about a lot of them, but you know, just kind of a quick rundown. You know, we ask, we go into some detail about what learning looks like. Obviously, that's detailed um, more heavily in some of the other sections as it relates to uh, the schedule and how that looks and uh, delivery of courses. One thing I will highlight in that one is um, that all students uh, will be in classes taught by, um, as Scott mentioned, highly qualified ICCSD teachers. That includes students um, in Edgenuity courses. Um, the big Edgenuity distinction is that it's primarily asynchronous. They are still paired with an ICCSD teacher, um, and they're not in class with other students in, in a sense. They're not engaging in collaborative activities and the sort of uh, engagement uh, with peers that we would, we would see in, in our other classes. Um, looking further down, uh, you know, certainly questions about enrollment, who, to whom it's available, uh, what courses are available. We've already looked at the course catalog. Um, a question about what technology will be available to families. And this is not uh, necessarily something that's different from our approach in the spring. Um, with the exception of the uh, district-wide PK-12 one-to-one program. So all students in the district will be issued a district Chromebook at the start of the year. That includes students who are um, enrolled in the ICCSD online program, as well as students who are enrolled um, in our standard instruction, whichever uh, model along the continuum we're in. Um, and then beyond that, also, uh, we'll continue to provide internet access to families who don't currently have access at home. So we have the link to the form that we use right there. Um, we still continue to proactively try to get in front of that one, make sure that we have the resources to turn that around uh, as we anticipate a surge here at the beginning of the year, toward the beginning of the year. Um, will there be a schedule? Will students be able to schedule coursework whenever they want? Um, that's something else that we detail and we link to that uh, detail here. Um, it does mention that students in Edgenuity courses have more flexibility in terms of setting that schedule on their own. Um, will it be available for the full 2020-21 school year? And that's something that, that Matt touched on and I think is really critical. Um, and that's that it will be offered for the full uh, school year regardless of other instructional delivery model changes. Um, so that's something that I think is important for families to understand as they decide what the best fit for them is. Um, what calendar does it follow? It follows our standard calendar, um, again with the link there. Uh, how is the program different um, from off-site continuous learning outlined in the return to learn plan? And this is an area that again we highlight the consistent com consistency component. Um, with the continuum of learning models, there's a possibility of transitioning in and out of models, um, which may or may not be at the district's discretion. Uh, within this program, you're essentially guaranteed that one model. Um, in the event, and I note this down in the, in the second paragraph, in the, district, in the event that we're offering regular instruction um, in a face-to-face -face or hybrid, hybrid for format, the big difference, you know, which is probably uh, pretty obvious to most folks, is that there's no in-person physical classroom instruction um, for students in this program. There is synchronous instruction, there's engagement with other students and with teachers, um, but not in that physical environment. That said, our coursework, and this is, you know, really what we're going for with the push to develop as many of these courses internally as possible, um, it's aligned to the same curriculum and standards uh, as our classroom. And, you know, we really try to try to keep that alignment in place. Um, question about uh, if my circumstances change, can I enroll or unenroll from the program? And we mentioned the transition points at the trimester. Um, also the, the deadline, which could be subject to change depending on our guidance from the state um, for enrolling. Uh, what online coursework platforms um, at the elementary level? Our coursework uses Seesaw, 
which is um, you know, something we think is appropriate for that level and pretty easy to use even for young students. Um, secondary levels Canvas uh, or Edgenuity for those Edgenuity courses that use the Edge platform. Um, we go into some detail here about what Edgenuity is, and I know that Scott already talked about that in some detail, so I won't go through all of it, but we do provide more information here about how it combines direct instruction videos, um, featuring on screen teachers, assignments, performance tasks, assessments, and then provide a link to that platform in case people want to go and learn more. Um, will students have a teacher and classmates? Yes, um, that's something that we want to make sure is clear again with with the exception in terms of classmates of ingenuity. Um, but they will have a teacher, they will have classmates. And one of the reasons that we're prioritizing synchronous uh, synchronous activities for some of those classes is that social element. We want kids to be able to get to know kids in their class, get to know their teachers, um, and that's something that we're, we're really excited to be able to offer uh, within an online program. Um, question about uh, special education, ELL, other accommodations, that's something that Diane just talked about, and that's basically the same text there. Um, will students uh, still be enrolled in a particular school? And this is something that could be important from an activities perspective. I still want to participate in a club or a sport or something that's offered. Um, and students will still be enrolled in the school that they would have otherwise attended. Um, and they'll still uh, have the opportunity to participate in those activities and, you know, be a part of, feel a part of that school community. Um, and hopefully make an easier transition back to it. That said, um, because, you know, we still don't know how many students will participate in this and we're still collecting that information, um, there's a strong likelihood that most students uh, will have classes with students or teachers who may be from other schools in the district. Um, so that's something that we, we know is a likelihood. Um, will students enrolled in the program have access to clubs? Yes, as I just mentioned. Um, and a uh, big question that we've received from, from a number of, of places is, will students enrolled in the program be provided with physical materials, thinking textbooks, works, workbooks, technology, um, that sort of thing? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, students will be provided certainly with some general resources like technology resources, um, but also specific requ resources required for the courses in which they're enrolled. You can envision an art student or an art student at the secondary level or an elementary student being provided certain supplies for their courses. And that's something that we are, we are planning to facilitate. So as our teachers are working to develop the courses, one of the things that they're working to identify is what physical resources are necessary. We still think that whether it's from a cost perspective or whether it's from uh, a delivery perspective, Identification of digital resources is obviously an important component, but we know that there will be some physical uh, resources that are needed as well. Um, information here that's are, are covered in the academic section about how many courses do students need to be considered full time, um, workload questions, which again is based or uh, is answered in another section as well. Um, do students have to log in every in every day? The program's really designed that there would be um, interaction logging into the platform um, every day uh, and that there's synchronous um, activities each day. Even for, you know, I have the note here about EDGE on the exception in terms of synchronous activities, uh, we do not expect that many, if any, students will have a schedule built entirely of EDGE courses. So we would expect synchronous content um, for pretty much all of our students enrolled in this program. Um, how does grading work? Uh, grading and credit accrual follow existing policies, closely aligned with grading practices in our classroom. Um, feedback, be continual, continual and timely um, in an effort to maintain high levels of student access success. Um, and then the questions about credit, how this will appear on a transcript were both addressed earlier as well, but our goal is to make these largely indistinguishable from those courses taken online or on site. Um, are they allowed, are students enrolled in this program allowed to come into ICCSD facilities to work on coursework? Um, while students can participate in clubs, uh, sports activities that are offered within the buildings, um, students are expected to utilize the online platform and virtual tools um, and should not plan to be on site to engage in online coursework. 
Um, and then the other thing we thought was important is what if students have questions or need help? And we identify some of those resources, whether it's the school office, uh, the district level if it's technology issue, provide links to the technology help desk. And then on every page in this website, on the left side or the right side in the contact us section, we have that information plus a link to a form uh, that can be used to submit questions. We'll get back to individuals who submit questions and also use that tool to help identify common questions that we need to add to this document or add within other sections. Thanks, Adam. So with that, we'd entertain other questions. I have a couple. Um, one, I, I know it said on there, I think it was in the FAQ of who it's the online program is available for, and it says anybody enrolled in ICCSD. Does that count anybody from another district that has open enrolled into our district? Can they open enroll into our online learning program? So that yes, they could open enroll into the district and then they'd have access to any of the options we'd have. So, um, you know, you may think about a a uh, smaller district that if they're not offering uh, that online experience uh, to their students, then a student could open enroll into Iowa City. Of course, those deadlines are passed for right now. So that district would first have to grant it. We would accept them uh, in that scenario, but um, that would be a potential yes. Okay, and then uh, Adam kind of touched on it with the how the grading works and stuff. Is there any real difference between um, like an ingenuity class versus one of the other classes and how the grading happens or how we're, um, you know, kind of helping the kids along and keeping them accountable to, you know, their class time and things like that. I know there's been a few questions to that regard, so. Yeah, within EDGE, um, you know, certainly every student who's taking an EDGE course is assigned a teacher for that, <clears throat> for that course. That teacher is available to help the student if the student reaches out with questions, but also one of the expectations of that, of that teacher who's, who's assigned to the student is for the teacher to be involved in monitoring the student's progress through the course, reaching out to them. The assignments and assessments are largely pre-built within the Edgenuity courses. So in terms of the grading, we can align uh, the grades to our, our grading systems. Um, so it wouldn't appear any different in that way. Um, but the, the assessments themselves are pre-built with an edge. So they wouldn't necessarily have exactly the same uh, you know, rubric that might be in use for an assignment within an ICCSC developed course. Thank you. I do have a, a question that has that's not about the online learning program. It's just about our well, it's specifically about our hybrid model. So I don't know if we're going to cover some more of that. Um, but if there's any other board questions about the online learning program, now's your chance. I just want to ask if the uh, FAQ we just looked at will be available to us after this meeting. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out what's the difference between an online uh, learning program and the continuous online learning program. So, so yes, it I will, could, Charlie. And I think that's a good question because I think a lot of people are still struggling with that in the understanding. And so, again, I think the, the easiest way to think about it is think about if we hadn't recommended to start off-site, that we had recommended that everybody was going to come on-site to start the school year. Then obviously they would have been in their classes and engaged that way. Um, and then students that would have selected the online learning program would be in that online experience and that's what their every day would look like. If we had started or recommended to start on site, we still know there'd be the potential that all those classes or whether it's the building or the district would have to eventually uh, or could eventually be asked to pull off site for a period of time, but they would still continue in their coursework and what they're learning with their classroom teacher. And so if you're in the online learning program, that's the consistent online experience for the trimester for the year that you're in. If you're in the other environment, you could be in a multitude of models as we transition throughout the year, depending on the status of the pandemic or any kind of spread that we would see in the building or the district. 
And so the continuous learning pro, you know, the continuous learning aspect, remote continuous learning is just an aspect of the continuum of delivery models we have. This one you really think is a standalone option on its own where you're not in that transition mode. So I don't know if that helps frame it. Um, that's how I've tried to describe it to people in that sense. But uh, remote continuous learning is you with your home teacher, um, say you're a third grader and you have a teacher assigned to you, that teacher is going to continue to deliver that instruction in any of those models. This one is going to look different for you. You're going to be assigned a different teacher than what that homeschool uh, grade level teacher would look like. Well, that helps. And it's probably more important that you understand it than that I do. So, No, that's okay. Because I think that's one we want to try to differentiate. You know, the other thing we've tried to do on the visual of the continuum of models, and I know Sean had a question on the hybrid piece there and maybe before we get into that specific question, you guys could just show the schedules for um, what that would look like as well when we're when we're on site or give any kind of detail you'd want to provide to that before Sean would ask questions. But um, it's also on that continuum of models you see that it's we tried to create it like a standalone uh, so people would see how that would stand different than in the fluidity of any of those models we'd be in. So anything from a hybrid schedule standpoint the academic team would want to add before Sean kind of dips in with that question. I know we had uh, some other, I mentioned that earlier about coming back to that hybrid piece. So Amy, Diane, or Scott there. I'll, I'll take the question. So um, the secondary schedules, I think right now, as we've moved to them um, most recently, there's the ability to operate them in on-site, hybrid, continuous learning off-site, as well as in the PK-12 because they, they matched them up to the period day, the eight period day and the seven period day at the junior high and high school. At the elementary, it's, it's not so clean. Um, the schedules that you see posted online will work for the PK-12 online program for elementary, as well as when we're in offsite continuous learning for that temporary period of time that we'd be in the continuum off remote. We've got some work to do. So if we're in the hybrid, the AAA slash BB, second week AA slash BBB, we would start to employ more of our traditional on-site schedules. We do have some work to do around the special schedule there. And then um, we have a third schedule, which is just our typical traditional on-site elementary schedule. Diane, did I do it justice? Yeah, you, you certainly did about the schedules. And I think you also did it justice when you said we have a little work left to do. I think it's the hybrid model is the one that we've spent, um, we need to spend a little more time on just to make sure that we have a clear understanding of, we know what's gonna happen when the kids are at school. That's pretty clear for us, but it's, how teachers can help support those kids who are at home while they still have kids in front of them at school, that's gonna be a little more of a challenge for us. So we imagine that the time when the kids are at home, they're gonna be engaged primarily in asynchronous learning. And we're just trying to kind of work through to see if there's any opportunities to offer some synchronous activities while they're at home as well. Amy, the only thing I'd add at the secondary level is um, we are absolutely working to get um, consistency across the system, so at the high schools and at the junior high, uh, but we don't have all the schedules on there at this time. For example, if we do an early release uh, PD day with a three o'clock dismissal, we've got to build those out, but again, we would build that with consistency across the system, so we've just got some work to do there. So question right. on the, oh, the, the hybrid model. So uh, Diane, you were saying the, the days that students uh, aren't, do, aren't in, in school and they're doing the asynchronous learning offsite, is that um, gonna be, do you think that will be like programs that are already existing or will the classroom teacher be required to create that stuff for those kids to do on those uh, off days? Yeah, we're envisioning that the classroom teacher will be um, designing those activities for students to be able to complete on those off days. Yes. Um, the beauty of the having teachers create these courses that are 100% online is they will be accessible for all teachers to be able to kind of pick and choose 
that there may be some activities that have been created for the online program that a teacher might be able to select and assign for her, his or her students during those offline days. And Diane, am I correct in understanding? I mean, and I think what's important for the public to understand too is even under a hybrid model where some kids are there three days a week and the other kids are there two days a week, the teacher is there five days a week. And so he or she isn't going to be available on your students off days to do that type of synchronous online learning because he or she will have a classroom full of kids at, at all times, correct? Our teachers aren't going hybrid. They would be full time. They would right. be. So we're looking at maybe some opportunities like the class meeting, right? So a teacher might be able to, at the beginning of the day, open up a class meeting to Zoom, have 12 kids in front of her, and have 12 kids maybe on Zoom and do some activities like that. Um, there may be some opportunity to do some small group lessons while kids are at Zoom. Um, but that is going to be, like I said, the majority of the time will be asynchronous while the kids are at home. Yeah, I think that's a, like Diane led with, that's a piece we still have to work through and we're working through very carefully because you articulated that point well, Lisa. I mean, that's that's the challenge, right? I mean, that they're trying to do all of those things, implement health and safety protocols while they're on site and then also trying to do that component. And so um, it's a little easier sometimes to wrap our head around secondary wise than, you know, when you think about a post-secondary institution and how they have a few uh, meeting dates and then there's other days where students are expected to continue their learning. But um, we're still looking at those possibilities. And so that's one that, um, again, we've continued to work on since we've kind of gotten some redirection and guidance here about what that hybrid plan um, would have to require and what we need to look at. So any other questions on the online learning program or otherwise we can kind of take the last two items here for return to learn. The other one's just probably a broad statement and I'll ask Kate to follow up if she wants to add any additional detail, but I know we've had questions around testing capabilities in the school um, around uh, COVID tests. And so we're actively uh, engaged in those conversations daily with the uh, University of Iowa hospitals and clinics uh, to see what might be possible or not. But uh, at this point, I don't think we're ready to share out any details around that, but do want to let you know we're still continuing to work on that and uh, may even have some additional information next week. But we know that's a question you guys have had board, as board members and also in the communities had. And so we're, we're continuing to try to look at that and what that might may or may not be able to look like for us and uh, for different segments of our student and staff population. And then the last component is probably the athletics and activities conversation. Uh, we know that um, that, that conversation kind of kicked up for us once we again made the recommendation for offsite. Um, but we wanted to probably just give you some information around where athletics and activities stand right now and then uh, some things to think about, uh, not asking for a decision or, or anything to that effect uh, this evening, but uh, just wanted to kind of open the door to that conversation. And so Chase and Scott are gonna uh, give you some overview points on that and then give you an opportunity to ask questions. Sure, and Scott, I'll just go ahead and get started. And as Matt said, we're not going to make a recommendation right now. It's just more to give you um, a view of the landscape as it, as it currently sits and as we know. And um, you know, sports athletics were reintroduced in the summer with uh, baseball and softball. Um, recently, the stat, state athletic associations for girls and boys have said that fall athletics can take place, um, though they made adjustments to the number of games in football and we're still waiting guidance um, on other fall sports. One of the questions that was asked um, earlier, I think Paul asked it about um, fall sports schedules. Um, if we delayed the start of our calendar um, right now, we have um, preliminary information that, that certain events would start um, in, in, the middle of, in the middle of August. Um, and that's not um, atypical for this year. Uh, golf usually starts um, their matches before the school year starts, even when we start in, in August. So we would have some competitions that uh, if the district does go forward with sports, that would begin before the September 9th start date if we delayed the start of the calendar. The State Music Association has taken um, a slightly different approach than the State Athletic Association. Um, they've determined that uh, all state auditions will be held virtually and they've canceled the state marching band contest. And so from our state associations, uh, between the arts and athletics, we see uh, slightly different approaches. 
Um, there's no state mandate that the district offer these activities or sports. Um, each district has the ability to choose to participate in various state associations. And, and so those three pieces are really the information that we know coming to us from the state organizations around athletics. However, as we think about this conversation um, as a district, we believe we have to look at it broader than just athletics. Um, we need to give consideration to operating all clubs, all co-curricular, all extracurricular, and all athletic programs. Um, we don't think the conversation um, can be as narrow as, uh, as just looking at, at our sports. It, we need to look at the arts. We need to look at our clubs that operate for our students when we decide what is the best approach for our district as we move into the fall. Um, and while we do have clubs, activities, and sports at all three of our levels, elementary, junior high, and high school, we don't believe it'd be necessary to have all levels participating in extracurricular activity. The board can make the determination by level um, at high school, junior high, and elementary. So we do think there is ability to look at um, certain levels differently. We just believe that if we are going to offer extracurriculars, we can't say we're going to offer this, but we're not going to necessarily offer that. We need to look at it um, for the whole spectrum. And, and lastly, we have started to prepare um, based on what uh, guidance we, we, we might get from the board or if it changes the, to work on health and safety protocols uh, for activities, sports and clubs in the fall. Um, as I said at the beginning, base, baseball and softball played this summer, and so we developed those. Um, the Athletic Association said that the practices and off-season training could start, so we modified those as we went through the summer. And so we've continued to build on those protocols to make sure that we have them in place um, if we do uh, move forward with, with sports in the fall. Currently, uh, because we haven't been told otherwise, we have been following the, the guidance from the state, and so some of those off um, season training sessions are happening and we do have um, athletes and coaches in our schools um, on pretty much a daily basis right now as they look at preparations for the fall. Again, not necessarily providing a recommendation one way or the other. Um, we, uh, we do just wanna provide a, a basic framework of what we know right now. And as Matt said, we'll open it up to any questions that, that the board may have. Chase, I'd add one other thing. Sure, and, Scott, sorry about that. You're no, right. No problem. We're just, uh, we're trying very hard to talk to numerous people. So uh, the Iowa City Schools are part of the Mississippi Valley Conference. That's the Cedar Rapids schools, uh, the schools in Blackhawk County, schools in Dubuque County. So we stay in contact with those school districts as they're making these same kind of decisions around activities. Um, I've got connections uh, back in Boone to the Boys Association and the State Music Association. And so we we really are trying to collaborate with those folks. And then internally, um, our band directors and choir directors, we're having conversations with those folks. And so just lots of conversations around activities. So I just wanted you to know that that is occurring. Uh, Chase and Scott, this is Charlie Eastham. Um, to describe to me again, the Health and Safety Committees and the uh, um, uh, the Johnson County uh, Public Health Office says recommendations about uh, testing for kids or students participating in sports and other extracurricular activities. What are they saying we need to be able to do to make those uh, that participation participation as safe as as it can be? Sure. Um... And Kate, I'm going to defer to you because I don't want to, to misstate um, about any of the distinctions that they have provided us in terms of testing students in school as opposed to students participating in extracurricular activities. I don't believe we've had that conversation to the level in which I feel comfortable really reporting out as a group right now. Primarily, we would always refer back to the CDC guidelines. Well, and Charlie, I just think that one's a hard one, right? Because I think when you think about testing and what would be ideal and then what we can actually do are two different things. You know, I mean, we have on one end of the country and, you know, our spectrum about them te testing Major League Baseball players every day as they participate. And then you think about what we can do for high school athletics 
and what that means and, and how we have kids that are potentially asymptomatic that are still uh, participating versus what we'd like to do and what we'd like to know around that and how we hold baseball and softball teams down uh, when they've had a positive test. And so I think the, the best um, information we can give without getting into the testing conversation tonight, I think, is how we do those screening protocols and trying to commit to those. I mean, that's really where we've had that guidance come from the health and safety team and how we've tried to do screenings uh, for students as we participated in summer athletics and um, conduct those. And then uh, kids that aren't showing symptoms are able to go. And then if you are, you, you don't participate and you have to uh, do those suggested next steps that have been given to us. And so um, I think that's the best thing. I, I think it just gets hard when we start talking about testing versus necessarily what we do in a, in a screening format. Those are two kind of different bars and um, levels of, I guess, security or of, of safety. So Matt, one more thing to that. Um, there's been a national study on the performing arts side of things and, and a big emphasis on mitigation strategies. And so there are recommendations around that for choir and band and that kind of thing, Charlie. So not so much on the testing side, but on the mitigation side. Okay, thanks. And I, I uh, <clears throat> maybe we should have a a little more information about how the screening is actually playing out so far in this district, or if we're not there yet, um, let us know what uh, what we're going to be looking for as kids uh, or, as, or as students, participants, athletes, athletes, so forth, so forth. Uh, do do uh, do do are removed from their activity because of some screening criteria. Sure. And so one of our ADs said that he would, he, he's been tracking some data. And so he would be happy to, to provide that as an example. And it's only, you know, data points from, from one school, but it is data that we can provide. And Charlie, we can um, provide you the, the, the criteria that we've utilized, the, the questions that we've had uh, coaches asking, uh, along with doing the temperature checks as uh, the students have reported this, this summer um, for participation. And so th that is detail that, that, that we have, and it's in that guidance that, that we're developing, um, that we have in draft form that kind of lays all that out. You know, what are the expectations when they show up? What are the expectations if someone is symptomatic or, or positive? Um, are they required to get a test before they return? Kind of the things that, that Matt laid out. And so maybe I misunderstood your, your question at the beginning. We have lined that out and um, it's very similar, I think to Kate said, about what we're looking at for our, our student population in, in general. And so we can go back to them and ask if we need to delineate those two out. But as we've continued to build this, we have pulled on the guidance that they've put out um, and then gone back to them to make sure, okay, is this you know what you meant by this? And does this match what the recommendations are from the CDC? So we can definitely um, share, that, share that guidance with the board if the board would like to, to, like to see that. Okay, thanks. Well, it's up to other board members to indicate if, if the, they want to uh, take take a look at that or not. Okay. I what kind of timelines are we looking at? I mean, it, are other fall sports practices started or starting or, you know, depending on what's happening with extracurriculars, right? I know, I believe my kids are supposed to start to, as, well, we're supposed to start a, a show choir, a choreography camp later on this week and things like that. So I, I didn't know where we were at with all that stuff if we haven't yet made a decision on the activities themselves. Um, what about all the, the prep work for them? Yeah, I mean, we've kind of been um, going ahead with what's in front of us in that regard. And so if there's going to be a decision to change course, um, that's what we would need to talk about. So otherwise, yeah, some of the, that fall uh, preparation like you highlighted with your own kids example there Sean I mean is is happening is occurring is scheduled uh, to that effect uh, so I would say that's um, why we wanted to give you probably a lay of the land and kind of a scope of where we're at that if there was some kind of a change in in direction or if they wanted if the board wanted to consider that um, we could do that but otherwise yeah we're we're just kind of taking the next things in front of us right now in that regard but we have canceled some things as we've published or told sports teams they can't do certain things because as we've published guidance to the board and the community about some of our health and safety protocols, we've, we've started enforcing those. One of those was um, no travel outside the district. And so if a football team or a volleyball team had a camp 
scheduled somewhere else, we told them they can't go because that's the guidance that, that we've already pushed out. So while we're letting some of the practices and activities continue, because as Matt said, we haven't um, received guidance otherwise, that doesn't mean that we aren't implementing the health and safety protocols that we've already announced that we're going to have in place in the district. Um, you know, I, I'm, re I'm really struggling with this, you know, when I, when I watch professional sports teams not being able to figure this out and the Hawkeyes, you know, having athletes show up sick and, 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 I, and not all sports are created equal. Um, you know, my experience uh, was playing football and wrestling. And if we're going through all this trouble to have a hybrid plan and keep our kids safe, and are we going to send our football team to play with a school that isn't, you know, is not, rec uh, uh, not recommending masks, not requiring masks, has uh, lower testing standards in place, um, you know, or we're going to have different rules for our fans. I mean, it just feels to me like the high school associations ought to be given a little more guidance on this, on, on how we can pull this off. Um, and, and I bring football up because you're going to have 22 people who will come into physical contact for three to four hours straight through, you know, how many plays do you play in, in a football game? And that's a lot of uh, blood and sweat and spit. You know, it gets pretty gnarly in there. Um, you know, I'm just having a hard time wrapping my head. And, and I, you know, for the people who say we need activities and things for kids to do, I agree. I, we, the more we can get our kids engaged and, and doing activities and getting together socially, where I'm struggling is um, competitions, you know, with districts that maybe don't have as stringent protocols in place. Uh, and are we putting then all of our kids at risk? Um, and, and despite how important athletics and other extracurriculars are to our kids in their education, it, you know, it's not going to be worth one death from COVID, you know, the whole season and the whole state is, you know, I'm not willing to put a price on that uh, to say, you know, and, and so I'm, and again, not all sports are created equal. Some can be done safely. I believe that, but I don't think all of them can be done safely. And so that's, that's just where I'm at with this. I think, you know, for a local school board to be making a decision that even the professionals in this industry and the, and the NCAA haven't figured out, um, you know, is, is, is pretty tough. Um, so anyway, I'm just letting folks know where I'm at, uh, you know, sharing kind of my, my consternation with this, with this issue. Scott or Matt, maybe you can, chime in on this, but one of the things that um, JP mentioned was the out of uh, other districts and what they're doing. Like, I think the MVC, and correct me if I'm wrong, for baseball, softball, like you, they had a meeting and they said, these are the guidelines and everybody in the district needs to follow the same ones um, as far as like spectators and when you clean the balls and where the extra dugout space is and then where fans can sit and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, as far as the districts go, the, or the, the conference at least is all, they come together and made those decisions before they let each individual district couldn't necessarily make their own decision on that. It was conference wide, right? Yeah, and even um, it's been a subtle change in football, Paul, but to your point, um, the schedules were always developed in football at the state level. That's the only one in football that does it. So Liberty was scheduled to play Ankeny and Ankeny Centennial and City was scheduled to play Ames and West High was scheduled to play Southeast Polk. Last week when the state reduced the number of games from nine to seven, they also said our schedules are out the window. And they said what we want you to do as schools is work with your local areas to have competitions in your conference or those things, Paul, where you could have common standards around that. And so the ADs actually met today to develop some tentative schedules around that. But yeah, we won't be going to Ankeny. We'll be working with our member schools, at least in football. Um, I asked them to have conversations around cross country and swimming and volleyball and golf and all that stuff. And they haven't got there yet, but they know they have to have those conversations as well. Um, because what you're worried about JP in terms of like community, cross community kind of stuff, yeah. 
So the state recognized, let's try to limit that. Much like the Big Ten said, you know, let's just play within the Big Ten. You question that wisdom or whatever, but it's the same thinking that's occurring in football with the Boys Association and the MVC. Did I answer what you asked, Paul? Scott, could you speak to then, like what about playoffs and, and that sort of thing? Um, yes, the playoffs on the back end all um, only allowed 16 teams before, and they're gonna allow everybody in now with the rationale that they're playing fewer games, so the data might not be as clean in terms of who should get in and who shouldn't get in. Um, so they're gonna go, I can try to do that in my brain. I think it was four weeks worth of playoffs and now it'll be six weeks worth just so that they could get everybody in the playoffs. But it's still um, Fridays only. JP, you may remember the old days where we really crammed in football and we did Wednesday, Monday, Friday, and it just wasn't safe. And so um, it's all Fridays now. I don't, I, I don't know the exact specifics on it. There's going to be buys because there's not a clean number of teams, but they are adjusting the playoffs. I answer that? Yeah, you know, I think my worry is that if we're going to stay in conference and then we go to playoffs, you know, that that opens that up again. Um, and, and again, later in the season, maybe maybe the data will look good. I'm, you know, I want to be hopeful and say that as things progress. But uh, in the beginning, you know, I can appreciate that they'll come up with their own rules. Um, that guidance been football specific, right? The, ex, the expanded playoffs and shortened season that's only been football that they've talked about? Right now, yep. I hope that's, that conversation isn't over though, Sean. I, I just wanna chime in and say that I share a lot of um, JP's point of view on this. I don't think all sports are created equal. I mean, I, I think that there are a, a serious difference between a golf team Comp competing and wrestling in terms of COVID risk. And, and so I appreciate that we're going to take a more nuanced kind of individualized take to it. But I also have to say, we can put all of the mitigation strategies in place. And if our coaches and players aren't willing to enforce them and abide by them, then it, it's not gonna do any good. And I am very disappointed in some of what I saw from our softball and baseball teams this summer. Um, in, in not respecting those mitigation techniques. And, um, you know, you see big pylons of kids after a big play, um, 10 people in a, in a jumping on top of each other. We got forwarded a sports picture of no masks, the team, the entire team by themselves with the coach. I mean, these are simple freaking things that shouldn't be happening, and they are. And it really casts doubt for me about our ability to to actually implement sports safely. Um, and, and that's one of my big concerns. I, I, I'm actually uh, sympathetic to what uh, JP and, and Lisa are saying too. I mean, I would be much more, um, I'm much more interested in whether or not the prevalence or incidence of COVID infection among students who are participating in sports is greater or different than the other the student population as a whole and i didn't hear scott from what you were saying that the associations are actually looking at that kind of data maybe i'm mistaken about that but if not then i personally think that's what we should be looking at in this district for sure i don't know i mean the testing allows you to get that information much more quickly, probably more accurately than uh, symptom checking does. But I, I think we, we, I think we have to try to figure out how to know that. Yeah, I don't know that data, Charlie, but somebody is collecting that data in terms of the number of teams that needed to shut down and if there's been any spread within a team. And uh, I'll try to get that from my contacts. Okay, thank you. And I can appreciate that, but there will be absolutely zero data on football. There is going to be zero data on return to learn. They're just. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Well, to that's, me. Yeah. That's that, it hasn't happened. The data, right, is that, you know, it's all after the fact. And sorry, I didn't mean to talk over there. I thought you were finished, but I think that's the difficulty is the data will be after the, after the event's done. That's when we'll know the data on some level. 
But well, if we know that if, if one event caused spread, then we know not to have any more events. Yeah, I mean, you could use it to inform those later ones, Charlie, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd step into that, you know, without the data, but then you could use. And so I think what your question was, then what's the softball and baseball data necessarily tell us about the fall? Maybe that's where you were trying to connect it a little bit as if we had that data, then what's that tell us about those fall activities? Yeah. Okay. I, you know, do think once um, you guys have, you know, I, and I'm sure you have this, but yeah, once we get recommendations, um, just to know how our metrics for what we're going to do, not just with schools, but for extracurriculars, as far as if someone uh, tests positive or whatever, just to, to know kind of what our protocol. And Scott, do you think that would be a shared among the conference as well, sort of uh, metrics on how you decide to, um, you got to quarantine a team or or um, call off a game? To date, I would say that those were developed by each independent school district, but they were shared and they were very similar on the baseball side of things on this half of the state. I can't speak to what happened in Des Moines JP, but um, like Cedar Falls and Cedar Rapids, those folks all had a very similar approach to that. Well, it's Will the associations one. come up with some of that? We're told that they're going to send us some um, guidance, but we haven't seen that yet. Because Scott, if I'm re remembering correctly, either the associations or the Iowa Public Health in collaboration or uh, with the DE put out some guidance for starting baseball and softball back at the beginning of June. Um, and so that was one of the things we first built our process on. And so I think that's why a lot of them were similar. And so JP, to your point, we just haven't gotten that yet. We haven't gotten that for the fall. Now, the DE has stepped away from fall sports and is not in the middle of it like it was in baseball and softball. So I don't know if that's going to change the approach coming out of Des Moines or not, but we're still cautiously optimistic that we're going to get some guidance from from some of the state agencies. So and it may seem pressing to us, JP, but it might not be to them because the official start of practice is August 10th. And so right now what we're in is a voluntary period, and argue whether it's voluntary or not, but the state really has a lens on that August 10th date of making sure we've got guidance to schools prior to that date. It's not very far away. It is not. I agree. Sean, that's our last return to learn item. So we're happy to continue to take questions on the athletics activities end if there are some, but that was our last, just so you know, we're at the end of that portion of our update. Yeah, I was going to throw it out to board member. You know, we, we hit a lot of stuff there. And I don't know, if, were there any questions as we went throughout it that board members want to revisit uh, obviously anything still on activities but um, anything throughout that whole uh, thing. go ahead Lisa I, yeah I had one that I wanted to circle back on um, back to the online um, opt-in has there been any thought about what to do with some of the classes that don't transfer across all three high schools um, I, like, for example, I think West teaches AP Human Geography while Liberty and City teach AP World History. And so if a, if a student starts online opt-in for first try and does a class that their home school doesn't offer and then they want to go back to their home school, um, what happens? Well, I think... Lisa, that they wouldn't have registered for a course to this point because they registered in January and February based on the course catalog for that particular school. So if you're a city high kiddo and they don't offer human geography, it wouldn't have been on the registration form. Does, am I making sense? Yes. What if you're a city high kid who knows they're going to be online all year? interested in taking the human geography class. Would, is, can we do some flexibility there? I'm not sure we fully vet, vetted that question yet. 
I just, I, I think there's some really cool classes that each of our high schools offer, either as a trimester only class or as a longer year class. And I would, I would hope that maybe we can take advantage of some of the benefits of online school. I think we always talk about the downsides of it, but there are some great benefits of it. Um, and kind of increasing the catalog might be one of them. Okay. We can take a look at that, Lisa. I think that's a good point. Like Scott said, I think we probably hadn't fully run that one out yet to know how that would work, but we can look at that. Hey Matt, a couple meetings ago, you, um, when you went through, when we were discussing like a hybrid option, you went through when a classroom uh, would get quarantined and when a school would get quarantined and, that, and whatnot. Is that on the district site anywhere or will that be on the district website or would I just have to go back to that meeting to reference it for people who have asked about that? Sure. So that one's a, there's a lot, there's probably a big conversation that needs to happen around that once we receive the uh, guidance from the governor uh, too, based on the news from that proclamation and then the, the DE guidance. And so honestly, that's been part of our frustration uh, in the timeliness of this, that local districts work to develop those uh, because those were absent uh, from our planning. And so we spent a lot of time internally working with our local health department to develop those. And that's where I was kind of leading with once we get the um, guidance from the Department of Ed and the Department of Public Health about what that looks like, uh, there could be some big conflict between what they had stated and what we had stated. I think we, we were pretty open with you that we had taken a pretty conservative look at that and uh, would be quick to transition the classroom or building or the district in that sense um, out of some caution. Uh, that state guidance may not um, work in concert with that anymore. And so then I think we'll need to take uh, another crack at that. Um, in answer to your question, it would be linked in the present. And, and I know that I don't know the date of that presentation we did. Um, I see Chase nodding his head, but I know it would be linked into that presentation we did. Um, and so I think what we'll wanna do though, before we promise that or, or probably share that any, any more widely would be uh, make sure whatever we receive from the state um, that I guess we kind of reconcile those two things is maybe the best way to say it, that what we started with and then where they're asking us to be and how that works together. And then just one more question on e-registration. Um, I know working those, uh, let's just say we're on the assumption we go online to start for everyone, but if we were to start hybrid with um, students, uh, part of that e-registration was there was one part where you all, uh, at least the secondary students, got their picture taken, uh, and then they also did stuff where they got their um, meal accounts and made sure they knew their number and all that, all that um, stuff. Would that just be something you'd have to push back to happen maybe at a later date since you're not we're not necessarily having the in-person e-registration anymore. Scott, do you want to talk about how you guys have talked about handling that as a team? I'm not sure I, I know that, understand the question. Run it by me again. Well, in the past, um, during e-registration at the secondary level, two of the things that students did was they got their picture taken for their student ID or their student records. And then they also um, usually met with the um, um, food service people to go over what their account number was and, and you know, put money in their account or how to do that or, or whatever. And, uh, and just if we happen to go back and it's a hybrid model, so there are students in school, will that all those things be pushed back to a later date to happen because we won't have that in-person e-registration? Um, we had that conversation today and I think, Paul, where we landed was that if we're um, completely off-site, we would do all of that, I'm going to call it orientation, all of that orientation virtually. If we land in some sort of hybrid mode to start the school year, then we would want to land in an orientation around some sort of hybrid, um, but not do it like we usually do. Frankly, when we do um, orientation, um, it's hundreds of kids in the building, you know, three days before the school year starts. So we would have to reconfigure how that works so we can, I've heard Kate use the word cohort. So we want to get kids in smaller groups and uh, cohort them together. Um, the thinking around pictures specifically is that they are in power school until we change them. And so we're going to just leave their photos from previous until we can get them on campus and get different photos. If that happens in January, fine. Um, we just have some, we have some time around the photo piece of it. Can somebody speak uh, pretty quickly to 
how uh, classes at the Kirkwood Regional Center would work with any of these models, including the online learning program? That's another reason why, Sean, we felt it was really important to get the building's schedules um, similar. So if you're on site in a normal situation and you're an academy kid, um, most, the vast majority of our kids do an, on, or, uh, an AM academy. And so by not having a different schedule for the online piece, kids can still do their Kirkwood Academies, which are all, by the way, virtual. They've announced that they're all virtual. So by lining that up, if a kid was supposed to miss first and second period so they could do their Kirkwood Academy, they'll still miss first and second period, and then they can jump into this um, school district's afternoon classes or third period on. Same with PSEO, Sean, if, if they're doing a class through the university. And they had the opportunity for those classes, even if they opt into the online learning program? Yes. I see Diane nodding her head. So. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Anything else before we move on? All right. We still got a lot of, a lot of work ahead of us tonight, so I'm going to move on. Um, so we have our uh, Lucas inquiry um, review that we did. Uh, we brought it forward, brought the report forward last week to kind of get it out there. And we wanted to make sure we had some time um, tonight to discuss uh, some actions that we might take from it, or at least steps that next steps that we're gonna take from the, the results that we saw or uh, actions that we were already kind of had in the works as well as far as just general things that we do uh, in our district. So um, I kind of push that back uh, to Matt and the team. Sure, thanks, Sean. So as I said last week, I think this uh, report uh, should provoke each of us at least to examine how we're contributing to a negative climate and culture at time. and. Um, I, I also believe that no one escapes blame in a situation like this one. And uh, those that suffer most uh, from something like this are our students. Um, so the bottom line is really as a district, we need to do better in that regard. And I wanna echo another sentiment that we shared last week and be clear that we do support Dr. Jenkins and her leadership at Lucas. Uh, we're committed to her and a successful start to the school year. And uh, really tonight, uh, we have three areas of focus that we plan to commit to as initial step steps to help restart that process at Lucas and restart that culture. And so the first one entails, um, we will be recommending the transfer reassignment of several teachers and staff at Lucas Elementary uh, to begin the process of resetting that climate and culture. Uh, secondly, um, we'll be con we will continue work with Dr. Jenkins to identify supports that will assist in her success at Lucas Elementary. And then finally, we'll deliver on the professional learning needs of that school community in regards to culturally proficient teaching practices, restorative practices, and professional development that is critical to achieving the Lucas Comprehensive School Improvement Plan goals. Um, so from uh, kind of a three-pronged approach there for initial suggestions from us on, on how to uh, move forward in this situation. And, uh, so obviously there's a lot of details, a lot of work that'll go into those uh, three different pieces, uh, but we think those are three critical steps as, um, and like I stated that as we've worked with uh, Dr. Jenkins and uh, looking at the year ahead uh, that we think are necessary to uh, improve the experience at that attendance center for our students. Any board members uh, have any questions on that or want a little more? Explanation. I don't think I need any more explanation. I, I can appreciate that. I do appreciate that. You know, you know what I'm wondering as I read through that final report, and and it's, you know, not surprising to me that um, uh, Miss Malloy uh, commented, you know, that this is likely a larger question, right? This isn't just about Lucas Elementary, and and what I wonder is. Is there any way administration can sort of uh, use our, our culture and climate survey data um, to maybe tease out 
some other hot spots where where we might also have similar culture concerns. I mean, it, could that be a data piece? You know, that would help kind of inform that because what I'm hoping is that what we do here at Lucas with a reset and trying to put a lot more intention around supporting Dr. Jenkins specifically around the culture and the climate of the building, you know, can we kind of locate those other places where we might be able to have an impact um, with other actions or similar actions? Well, I think definitely, uh, JP, from the aspect of as we look at those student experience surveys and then the action steps we try to build into school improvement plans, um, I do feel that's part of our work. I feel like that's part of our responsibility to improve the culture in those buildings. Um, you know, I think what we got to at Lucas was a tipping point in that, um, that I think all of our buildings have work to do in that improvement process and different levels of improvement um, that they need to make in that regard. And so, of course, that student data uh, definitely drives those conversations. I think the other thing in particular, and just saying it out loud in this situation, is our ability to support a successful black leader in, in her experience as a school leader in, in that school community, too, and how there's a different variable at play uh, when that happens. And so I think that's uh, probably what makes Lucas a little bit unique in that regard uh, in this situation. But I do appreciate the comments about overall, what are those areas where our buildings need to improve and what are the data we're using to drive those decisions. Hey Matt, uh, real fast, it's Janet. First, thanks for the support on uh, Dr. Jenkins. I think that's really important. I also wanna just expand that to say thank you for your support of proper ethical actions, words, tone in our community in some of the public statements that you've made and just wanna issue my thank you for that. Um, question is around some of the findings from this review. Are there any things in our CDEP that maybe should be prioritized from a, you know, a, a, something that needs further action? It's sort of aligned to JP's comment, right? We've got data from our climate survey, but are there some goals and activities in our comprehensive diversity, inclusion, and equity plan that might need a heightened focus or stronger priority based on what we've learned from the Lucas review? Yeah, I think definitely, Janet, and I think the, the key thing for us that probably keeps coming back in a lot of these situations, and especially we talk about the, the word culture here, um, is really when we talk about that school environment piece and when we look at that. And so goal three uh, is really the one, and I think that even comes up in our conversation we'll have later at the board work session with the equity committee and what we've heard from the groups we've spent time listening to is that culture is key, you know, that if we don't have a foundational culture that is um, that can lead to success. A lot of the other things we do around that culture are going to have limited return. And so that focus on culture, um, as it's specifically stated, create equitable, inclusive, and supportive school environments for goal three. Um, I really think a lot of our priority has to be put into that and into our school campuses, that that is our focus and that multiple things build off of that. And so that'd be my quick answer to that question. I think there's several components, though, that, of course, we'd want to link to that comprehensive diversity, equity, and inclusion plan that you referenced, um, and that should drive our work, but I do like where you're going as far as, okay, what are the priorities, right? Because we've talked about that repeatedly too at that plan. It's big, it's large, there's a lot of work to do there. So how do we prioritize what's most important? Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'd just like to say that one, uh, I personally think that as a, as a board and as a administrative staff, we have responded to what was a clear community call to uh, to redress a situation that um, that unfortunately um, you know developed, um, and uh, so I, I I think I personally have viewed this as a learning experience for me to try to understand how to re uh, to respond. To, uh, to instances where uh, black leaders of, uh, uh, in the district are, have not been treated well at all. Um, I do hope that, uh, that we as a board and as an administration uh, can view this as, a, as an indication of what we should uh, strive not to have happen in the future. Um, and uh, I don't know if we need to do that in some kind of a formal way, but uh, boom, perhaps we can talk about that at our retreat that's coming up uh, here in a week or so. 
the uh, uh, I'm I'll be interested to see how members of the Black Voices Project and other groups in the community uh, react to uh, our view what we're what we've uh, found and what we're uh, proposing to uh, correct. So uh, I don't think this is a and I also want to join with what everyone else said in supporting Dr. Jenkins. I hope that she knows that uh, she does enjoy the full full support of this board administration as she continues her career and work at, uh, at an elementary school that uh, I think she make great contributions to in the future. So Matt, do you um, do you need any, I guess, any more direction from the board in some of these next steps? Um, I know you're kind of throwing it out there to see if you know the board felt like you were going in the wrong direction or something like that. I think we're supportive of um, the the efforts in general, but I didn't know if you need anything more specific from us to um, kind of move forward. I know the, the school year is approaching quickly. Um, maybe we have a little bit more time if we end up with a delayed start, but uh, if we're looking at um, some larger changes, right, we need to make sure we have time to, to do all those things and be fair to uh, Dr. Jenkins and, you know, all the staff that might be involved with anything. So anything we need to do. Yeah, I think the the biggest thing is just making sure that we have the support for those changes and that if we're off base in any of those uh, aspects that we're, you know, uh, kind of, I guess, essentially discussing about how our plans are set to move forward with any of those we'd want to know. Um, otherwise, just the, the support to continue down that path and uh, to continue to work for, like we said, a successful start to the school year and a successful school year overall and, and moving ahead. And so um, I think, you know, we feel well positioned to, to take those steps and just wanted to make sure you were well informed of what those steps were going to be and that if uh, we needed to have any further conversation before we did any of those things that uh, you were able to give that input. With that, any board members have anything to add or um, I say um, keep moving forward. That'd be my direction there. Uh, nothing else. Uh, I move on to our next item. Uh, which is our, our legislative priorities. Uh, I will tell you that um, I had this great intention of going through the priorities that uh, ISB sent us and I, I wanted to make it clear that uh, this is kind of our input to IASB on what priorities of theirs that we think are important um, so they can uh, shuffle theirs to the top. It is not necessarily dictating what, uh, you know, our very specific, you know, district ones are, you know, we create our, our nice little brochure um, every year that is very specific to us. This, we're not trying to do that tonight. I'm just trying to get from the list of things that ISB sent uh, to kind of rise some to the top and we get to enter four of them. Um, online and I think it, it goes to all the districts and the, whatever their top four is, I think is what they take. I'm not exactly sure how it works. They gave a suggested uh, four and uh, I wasn't sure that they were my top four. So I had intended to come to you all tonight with my top four and I, I got down to nine. Uh, so I, I failed on narrowing it down to four. Um, but there are some overlaps and I kind of want to you know, let everybody kind of weigh in on some of the things that they're talking about. Um, I'm sure you've all memorized all 30 of the recommendations from IASB. Um, the ones that they have, uh, out of my nine, I will say four of them were the ones that IASB recommended. Um, one is uh, funding preschool and mental health and that's the second one and then the other two are on just kind of general funding school funding policy and the supplemental state aid which i think they kind of go together so why they have two different ones i'm not really sure um, but there are um let's see how many that i added five on there and i'd like to kind of get everybody's take on 
you know, either my thoughts or your own thoughts. But one I added just as a standalone is um, uh, specific funding for uh, English language learners. And then there's a couple that are very uh, staff specific. It's number 15 and 17, which is uh, something, 15 is one that uh, JP has talked about a lot. It's on uh, teacher recruitment and licensure and it has reciprocity in there and things like that. Um, and then 17 is just labor and employment laws. Um, I think this board in the past has been very clear on how we feel about what the state did to chapter 20. So that's an important one. And then current events kind of made me look at a couple more towards the end, 25 and 26. 25 being an unfunded mandate, which I kind of feel as the governor tells us what we can or can't do with how we do school. I, I don't know that we're gonna see a whole lot of extra funds to make some of these things happen. Um, and right into 26, which is local accountability and decision-making, um, which I feel kind of got yanked out from under us. Now, whether we want that to be a, either one of those being a legislative priority, I don't know, but it was very front of mind because of recent actions. So. I didn't narrow it down to my four, I, I gave you nine. So I would love to hear what anybody else thinks or if you have no opinion really at all because <laughs> it's not our specific stuff and we can spend a lot more time on that later. Hey Sean, it's Janet. I had uh, identified the local accountability too for me as a priority. Um, I just think this current situation um, ex exemplifies that all of our districts are different in the state and local elected officials who are there to represent constituents based on data of their particular school district. I feel extremely strongly that we need to have the ability to enforce uh, decisions that are in support of our local conditions. Uh, and, and so, so I'm with you. There are so many other, it's really hard to prioritize, but I personally would put that local accountability um, higher than 26. I would put it, you know, much closer to the top. I, I would support that too. Uh, uh, we, we may be in a, um, and uh, we're not going to win this fight right now situation, but I still think it's important to, to, uh, to, to at least to, to me, to let people know locally here what I think the legislature should, legislature should, uh, should be allowing us to do. And that, that's as much, that is as important as anything else right now. Yeah, I would agree that that rises to the top along with right next to it are the unfunded mandates. I mean, they're gonna, you know, they pass that therapeutic classroom bill. Um, and from reading that and knowing kind of what that would take, they haven't funded that remotely enough. And I, I just think you know, if the legislature is going to get active in passing legislation requiring schools to do things, then I just think we have to emphasize that they need to provide funding for, for that. Otherwise, you know, we're just going to trade therapeutic classrooms for larger class sizes somewhere else because um, we're not going to have the money. So those two, and then and then for me, um, if I would have four, Chapter 20 would be in my top four, restoration of Chapter 20, and then uh, this kind of goes along with unfunded mandates, but certainly um, full funding for the child mental health bill. You know, I think those are probably my my priorities this year, along with my yeah my pet project of of reciprocity for out of state teachers. So I'll just jump in here. Um, I I agree with ev what everybody has said, uh, but I I would prefer to see uh, mental health being one of uh, the ones we sign off on because uh, we, especially um, given the situation that we're in now and all of our students struggling with being isolated, I think that's very important to have that as a priority as well as preschool. Um, we know the earlier we can get our kids into our buildings, um, that's going to be make a huge impact on how successful they can be. So that's just my two cents. Hey Matt, these ones that we're trying to figure out now are just uh, what we're uh, sending to the ISB, right? Not necessarily our, our ones. So um, having been at the convention and being part of that ISB delegate um, debate, uh, I, I'm okay with whatever you guys decide with. 
Uh, I just wanted to throw out there that um, what really needs to happen or what we really need to push for are pro education uh, people to win the elections in November. So uh, regardless of what we say here, uh, that's what needs to happen. But when we drill down to the ones for our specific district, then I just want to, you know, just make that same statement that I said before that we just need to be really specific on our ass for what we, what we want, like we did last year. And I would just chime in and I am going to um, agree with Janet's point about local control and Ruthina's point about preschool. Those are, are two of the really ones that stick out to me. All right, so we have, I think August 10th, I think was the date on there that we have to submit to IASB. So here's one, I'm, I'm gonna give everybody a little bit of homework. I want you to kind of go through the 30 and I want you all to send me your top four, but in order, whichever one you think is the most important, we'll put it at number one and I'll kind of gather it all together and weight them. And as a collective, whichever four rise to the top, it's what it's gonna be. Is everybody okay with that plan? If, if your uh, top four isn't the exact four we pick? Yes, when do you need that? Um, hopefully, uh, you know, by kind of the middle of the next week, I think that's, uh, let's see, the first is on Saturday, right? So we have until the 10th. And I think it's literally going online and clicking which ones you like. So it won't take much time at all, but um, maybe, you know, by a week from today, uh, okay. you know, when we have our next meeting. And if you haven't done it, I'll call you out into the board meeting so everyone will know that you didn't do it. Public shaming always works. Well, accountability will be there. <laughs> I might do it. All right. It, uh, Sean, real quick. If yep. any of the board members are struggling finding a fourth, because I didn't hear a four from every board member, and they'd like me to sing the praises of JP's pet project on reciprocity for teachers, um, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, it, it really is a critical issue. And I know that every one of the directors would tell you that the pieces you talked about for the areas are critical too. But as we look at where we are in staffing and teachers not going into the profession, and as we look to diversify our workforce, being able to more readily and easily recruit teachers from out of state is critical to some of those long-term plans. And like I said, I've kind of stolen the floor here from my other um, directors because I know they would give stump speeches as well. But I just know it's not something that's really gone to the front of the association's thinking but it really is something that I would ask the board to consider, if not for this, but for your platform later in the year that we take a hard look at and really try to get others to join us in terms of how we can um, better attract talent to the school district. So, so JP, I appreciate you, you champion that, I really do. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else on that, uh, we can move uh, down to uh, agenda setting. Um, we have obviously our, our special board meeting next week is, you know, it's an off week, so it's kind of a return to learn plan. Uh, but as a reminder, uh, we are scheduling our public hearing on a calendar uh, delay uh, to start that meeting off. And we will also take action on that at that meeting. So um, a reminder to anybody listening that wants to, or has some questions about that, they should get those to us. Um, and we can try and answer them between now and next Tuesday. And if not, we will try and get them answered on Tuesday. Um, so a little bit more involved for a special meeting than it ordinarily would be, uh, but time is of the essence on that. Um, and then we do have, uh, we have landed on Saturday the 8th, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday um, to have our board retreat. And we currently have uh, a few things on there. Um, one, we're kind of look at our board goals uh, for the next school year, which is going to be an interesting one for sure. Um, I will try and come with, you know, we have our look back at our 2019, 2020 goals and how we did, and we'll kind of use that format to help us uh, 
you know, figure out uh, this coming year's goals. Uh, but we also wanted to touch base on timelines and steps for our superintendent search. And thanks to our announcement last week, we're going to kind of discuss some um, steps on uh, a board vacancy, uh, what our options are um, as a board to, to do, as well as some of the timelines that we need to ad adhere to in that. So we'll, we'll talk through those steps. Um, I know Charlie had mentioned um, something earlier, um, and I can't remember specifically what it was, but he said maybe we could add that on to the, the board retreat. Uh, I know that in my head, in the moment, I was thinking uh, it would probably end up being part of our goals, and now I have completely lost what it was that Charlie brought up. Do you remember what you had said? Oh, uh, thanks a lot, a lot for <laughs> jinxing me here. So, <laughs> I, no, I don't. But if 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 we get it, uh, um, I, I think it would fit within a board goal uh, agenda item. Charlie, you were talking about the Lucas follow-up, and oh, oh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, and yeah. So support of our um, yeah. black administrators and kind yeah. of what we're doing as a district. I think that can, yeah. I think that can fit nicely within some of our goals. I think we can have that conversation yeah. within that yeah. same format. Yeah. Thank you, Paul, for reminding us. Yes, um, but I think that will that will be a, a fairly full retreat. Um, so I don't want to add too much more there. Then we do have um, our next regular board meeting is on the 11th. Um, obviously, we have you know all the regulars and we have some uh, financial reports. Uh, and I mean, we will get a return to learn update in there as well um, as we have been weekly. Um, I don't know, Matt, was, was there any of the other stuff that we had kind of in our parking lots? Uh, were we going to try and get those in August? I think something we were going to get in August, but maybe it was the second meeting in August. I don't have it pulled up right now. I didn't have another August item. Um, obviously, legislative priorities we just handled. You're talking about the retreat. Uh, a lot of the other items we had marked for September. One thing that came up was ally training. Um, that we had talked about before, if that was something you wanted to try to fit into the retreat or not. Um, with that date, I still, I think Laura could do that for us, but I'm not sure she can make that date work. I haven't had that conversation with her, so I don't want to put her on the spot to that this evening. But if that's something we want to pursue, we can check on too over the course of the next couple of days. I think it's something we want to pursue. So why don't you kind of offline look at whether what timing looks like and whether we can you know, find a date that works for that uh, in conjunction or if we need to do something different. But I think it's something we should certainly uh, look into. Yeah, I talked to her about the concept. I just need to work out logistics with her and I don't expect her to answer that tonight, so. Anything uh, else that directors think we need to hit early in August? I know we're gonna be kind of making a lot of decisions and a lot of work's gonna be happening as we're coming up at the beginning of the school year one way or another, so. Uh, I don't know how much extra stuff we can add, Paul. Yeah, I just a uh, couple things. Uh, I will not be at the meeting on the fourth or the eleventh. It's at the same time as the course that I'm taking for um, substitute teaching is at, um, so I'll have to miss those two meetings. Um, so when you guys do the agendas for the twenty fifth, can you add a spot on there at the end where I will officially resign? And also maybe at that meeting, if possible, I would really love to hear an update from Dwayne on the projects that are going on now before school starts, just kind of pro um, progress of those. Got those written down. <laughs> Anything else? Let me close this. All right. so. Before we adjourn, I want to remind everybody that we do have uh, a work session still, and we are going to be using the same uh, Zoom link. So all the directors and any, uh, uh, all the board members and any uh, admin folks that are, are sticking around, just stick around. Uh, we will will adjourn this meeting and then call the other one to order, but we won't leave the Zoom. And uh, for the equity committee folks that are Hopefully all here as attendees, we will um, promote you to panelists uh, as we do that. And uh, Kim and I both have a list of names. Hopefully the name that shows up on the screen is what you're 
name is instead of just some initials or something. So we'll do our best to get you added on. So I, I wanted to get that before we adjourn because I didn't want everybody running away. Um, but can we have a couple of minutes in between adjourning and calling at other meetings to order? <laughs> just a couple. Sure. We, we'll take, right. <laughs> it's going to take us a little bit of time to get everybody on there as panelists. Okay. Um, so how about, let's see what time. I got uh, 7.49. Can we try and start it at 7.55? But we'll, in the meantime, we'll try and get all of the panelists as panelists. All right? Thank you, Sean. Sure. good? All right, with, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this board meeting. Moved so moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone.